Everybody who is still outside should take the chance to join us now. I know the food is delicious, but it would be a pity. The greatest. Well, in any case, good afternoon, or, ah, you know, it's, it's five, yeah, good afternoon uh, to everyone joining. Welcome to another live session at the Reactor Berlin. Also, a warm welcome to everybody joining online. We've been doing this for quite a while now, so I hope you don't mind me asking, who of you has been to one of the Reactor events before, perhaps even in one of the older locations? That's, that's cheating. Okay, fair enough. Good to see you again. Um, However, as some of you haven't been here, uh, we have a code of conduct, which I need to quickly guide you through. Uh, before we get into the session, please take a moment to read this. Basically, what I'm saying is we are all here to learn something, so please be respectful of other people's views. This also goes for these people participating in the chat online. Um, differences are not a problem. We can argue about stuff, but please be kind and considerate in the way that you engage with the other participants. The chat, speaking of it, will be open throughout, and we do encourage you all to participate. If you have any questions, let me know, and I will share them both with the audience and with the speaker by the end of the session. Alrighty, first things first, this is the Wi-Fi code. Protect it with your lives. You've got uh, about 10 seconds to take care of this. Yeah, take a photo, that's brilliant. Um, Tonight's topics are broadly distributed across the field of modern app development. You will see that, for rather obvious reasons, we have a ton of AI stuff uh, packed. But I'll be starting with some Azure news uh, and one event announcement. After that, we'll get right into the sessions. Did anyone join us at Build last year? We've been in Berlin with Microsoft Build in 22. Was anyone of you there at Westhafen? Again, the Microsoft folks. Well done. Um, anyways, the registration for Microsoft Build 23 is online now. Go to build.microsoft.com. Uh, the in-person event this year will be taking place in Seattle. You gotta go there if you can. Um, but the first two days are shared online with our global community, so you can have a look at the sessions from uh, wherever you are. Once again, we'll be joined by partners and experts from multiple uh, branches of app development and engineering to discuss the latest and greatest solutions and tools. I was told we wouldn't be having German voiceovers for the keynote this time. Uh, trust me, it will be amazing. Apropos amazing, since a couple of days, Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB vCore service is available in preview mode. Consider this an alternative to the original Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB uh, throughput architecture. You can choose which architecture is used to work better by now. Uh, the service is well integrated with other Azure services for one and open source services such as uh, PostgreSQL and Apache Cassandra. We designed it to be extremely cost efficient, especially for the testing and development phase um, because these can be done on non-HA clusters. So uh, you practically save, I guess, about 50% of the cost on these. As always with features in preview, we appreciate your feedback. Please feel free to drop us a message. And with that, um, is there any quantum computing people among us? Not even close? Okay. Um, I understand that this is primarily important to those of you who work in research and development, uh, but still, it's pretty awesome because science. Uh, basically, what we mean by hybrid quantum applications is a mix of classical and quantum code uh, that now runs on continuum in Azure Quantum. The key, <clears throat> beg your pardon. the key advantage of our new release is uh, adaptive phase elimination, which means, for mere mortals, uh, that the calculation you are doing can iterate and adapt while the physical qubits are coherent. If all of this sounds a bit irritating and you care, we have uh, extensive documentation on the taxonomy and architectures of quantum computing on learn.microsoft.com. This is a very helpful resource, so feel free to check it out even if you're not into quantum computing and stuff like that. You can try the features for free, um, and all users get an initial amount of Azure quantum credits. Somebody left the door open, I suppose. 
or is it because somebody is using AWS in this room? <laughs> no, but, but seriously, could somebody mute that, please? Annoying noise. Um, to the guys in the stream who hopefully cannot hear this, we have a very annoying beeping noise in the background. I shall take care of this quickly and be back with you soon. Yeah, somebody uh, left a door open, as it happens. Damn, as I was about to elaborate on, uh, you can try these features for free, and you get an initial amount of Azure Quantum credits, uh, plus you can apply for additional research credits if you like. Bah! Let's get back into this mentally. Because, <laughs> yeah, that, that should be easy. Um, the agenda tonight will be as follows. After some introductory words that I already did, uh, we'll have tonight's first session by Chris Heilmann, Principal Program Manager at Microsoft. He'll talk about the application of AI-powered programming tools in front-end development. After that, starting at 5.50, Jan Duval, sitting there, uh, will deliver his session on choosing web frameworks, followed by a 15-minute break in which you can have all the additional snacks you can fit into a 15-minute break before we hear Stefan Judis talking about testing with Playwright. And for the final session, it's my pleasure to announce Google Fonts Design Lead Tobias Kunisch. Yes, I actually said that. Uh, who will be talking about new font standards and new ways of typographic expression. Enough, I say. Please welcome a survivor of the browser wars over the last 25 years, Microsoft's very own Chris Heilmann. An applause, please. <clears throat> hello, hello. So let's connect and see if everything works out. It worked earlier, but that's got nothing to say. Uh, that's me, not my screen, so that's good. That's my screen, that's better. That's my screen on the screen, so excellent. Uh, I like that the first thing was about quantum, and I just had to think about uh, uh, Endgame, the movie, when they said, like, can you stop saying quantum and put quantum in front of everything to make it sound cool? But it seems like that's the thing we do now. So, hey, why not? So, um, today I want to talk about web development, and I want to talk about the AI part of web development and how it's, we're in the middle of a massive, massive hype that is really confusing the hell out of me because I've seen it about eight times happening in the times that I've been a web developer. So I call it centering diffs in new and exciting wrong ways with AI because we try to solve the same problems over and over again and we're always using new technologies to do that. So why can I talk about that? I've been 25 years a web developer. Uh, I actually started by, uh, in 1996, I wanted to build a website and I didn't have any money so I asked a friend of mine to get me a, a, a pirated copy of front page Microsoft. He couldn't get me a pirated copy so I learned HTML instead and that was the beginning of my career which was pretty nice to have back then. I wrote three JavaScript books, contributed to dozens of other books. I blogged since 2005. I'm a W3C member on the Machine Learning on Device group. I worked on Firefox and on Microsoft Edge, and I'm a Chrome, uh, on the Chromium Developer Tools and the VS Code integration. So I've used this technology of the web in bloody every environment you can think of. And it's been exciting to do that. 
and uh, I will see what's next for me and for others as well. So when you become a web developer these days, you have so many choices, like there's so many courses online and so many options there. And of course, this morning I went through YouTube on my TV and I saw what's happening there. And I love this a web development, a practical guide in 2023. And it's two hours, 40, 54 minutes and 24 seconds. That's a practical guide. And the next thing I found was the crowdfunding Web 3.0 Web app with modern technologies by JavaScript Mastery. Build and deploy a Web 3 blockchain crowdfunding platform Kickstarter. That sounds like word garbage that an AI would have written on and put in there. But it's actually three hours and 33 minutes of fascination about what you could do with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Now, you don't need a two and a half hour introductory course to web development. It is not that complex. The thing to remember is whatever you do, whatever you start with, whatever language you do, in the end, there's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and graphics, and videos. That's basically ending up on your end user's machine. So no matter what language you start with, these things and what they do is something that you should understand or at least know what they're doing. The sad part of it is that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript evolved immensely in the last six to eight years, and most of the feedback that you get on Stack Overflow and things like that is from 1998 to 2001, and complaints about things that have been fixed for a long, long time. HTML used to be there just to, to, uh, to lay out documents. Now it's actually an application framework kind of uh, describing what different parts are. CSS used to be there just to color things and to uh, remove the underline of links. That was a fascinating thing to do. And nowadays it's a proper layout engine with animations, with transitions, with even in-page transitions that we have right now. And it's becoming rather complex and it's becoming really, really fascinating to see what you can do with CSS. And JavaScript is there to actually make sure your users wait four to five seconds until the page becomes interactive because you created a 16 megabyte bundle from all the NPM modules you found. All of these things are great, all of these things we have there, and it's not that complex to learn them, but we always want to make it easier. We always have this dream of building something. And a few weeks ago, a really bad thing happened, or a really great thing happened, when, uh, when GPT-4 came out. And that was part of the demo that they showed there. And it was basically like, oh, I painted something on a piece of paper. And with GPT magic and AI and pixies and whatever, it actually turns it immediately into a web page, into a working HTML, CSS, and JavaScript web page, which is cool. It's really amazing if you think about it. But it's also nonsense that nobody ever would build by hand or should build by hand or should be forced to build by hand as an engineer. We pay you money for doing sensible things, not for things like that. So I'm happy that this is automated. I'm really happy that we don't have to do that crap any longer. But it, it, all the press, especially the main press, was all going crazy about it, saying like, oh, web developers aren't necessary anymore. You're all going to be homeless and you're all going to be come goat farmers or whatever else you might want to have. So it's really, really cool that you can turn this into HTML and CSS and a bit of JavaScript, um, but what's it for? What is this thing actually doing? And the thing and the biggest problem that it has, it's that's the old misguided dream of what you see is what you get. And what you see is what you get is always like you paint something and it becomes a web product. What it forgets is that a web product is not one interface. A web product creates lots of interfaces depending on what the end users are using. This person filming with a mobile phone here, except of listening to me, for example, will get a different website than somebody on a desktop machine or on a HoloLens or on, I don't know, a Wii U or whatever. Like, you always have one interface and in, these, in these systems, and that builds it for one use case. And if you want to do that, go into native development, paint things on a screen, don't go on the web. The web is better than that. The web is not supposed to build things like that, because otherwise we could go back to front page, because that offered the same things. Like, oh, here's, your, here's how I build it, and then you do it. I understand it. This came from Ball and C Builder or uh, Visual Studio, no, Visual, Visual Basic Studio, whatever it's called. But basically, painting a website is an impossible thing to do, because web development is much more than that. 
So another big thing that came around was Galileo AI. Uh, it calls itself co-pilot for interface design, and the people on Twitter promoting it are calling it ChatGPT for UI, UI design, so there's a bit of a communication problem between those two as well. But it's actually a really interesting idea that they had there as well. You can do uh, like any other system that we have right now. You can use a, a, a human sentence, and it creates a web product for you. And it actually creates the interface for you, and it actually does all kind of things, like here's forms, here's kind of inter internet sites, and again, some ever said, RIP web developers, we don't need it anymore. Yes, for that, we weren't needed at all. This is exactly why all the native app stores are flooded with crap apps, hundreds of them, that all do one simple thing. Paint the duck, paint the dog, paint the cat. Look for it, really look at it. There's about 5,000 apps about painting one picture for children. I'm like, why don't you just allow people to have different photos in that one app instead of having 500 apps that do the same thing? But they're all generated automatically. And we now have similar things going in that, and it's innovation for some reason. I, I really thought about buying that domain, but then I realized it's only like, it's really expensive and only two years, so I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna spend my money on other things. It's basically stupid drum and pun on like everything, so it looks the same. Uh, and that's basically the problem with those things. Trained on thousands of outstanding designs, uh, this turns natural language prompts into high fidelity designs, and it also creates the copy for you in an instant. Now, who is the audience for that? If you want to build an app, if you want to build a product, if you want to build a pro uh, something that is unique to you, do you want to use other people's designs and generic copy, or do you actually want to stand out and make it your product? You're not building anything like that. You're just building lots of things that flood the market. I mean, as an SEO black hat person, this is heaven right now. I can write a blog post with two clicks that sounds interesting, is already optimized for links and headings and everything. I don't even have to work any longer. It's just gorgeous. But web design isn't that. It's not that easy. Which is weird, because I said earlier, it's easy. It's, it's easy, actually, in terms of the technologies behind it. But the design part is only the smallest part of it. It's the beginning of something. You don't create a graphical interface and define a single interaction. You don't do like, I have a joke site and the button, it clicks and shows me another joke. Okay, who cannot press a button? What if, it, what if I have a touch interface? What if I actually cannot see the screen? What if I don't know what that button is? Because the generated code is sometimes so generic that it doesn't use a button element, but it uses a diff with 10,000 classes on it that a screen reader user would not be able to use, for example. So. Web development means building interfaces that work in dozens of environments, and all of those in different settings. I have a dark mode and a light mode. I have a high contrast mode. I have no screen on. I have text only. I don't have any sound. My, my, my camera doesn't work. All kind of options in there. They allow for user customization. The interface of your products on the web belong to the end user, not to you. I need to resize the fonts. I need to resize my screen. I need to zoom in 400%, and your design still has to work. And that's something no machine can, take, uh, can do for me. That's something I have to know as a developer, and a tester has to go through it by hand as well. It has to favor the most important interactions. The search box should always work. Everything else is nice to have. The, the bu uh, press the button to get a joke, or just display the bloody joke without even pressing a button, would be a great opportunity. And then more convenience when and if possible. So if there's a big screen, give me more links. If there's a big screen, give me three jokes next to each other, make them battle each other, or whatever you want to do, or create an image that is funny too. And web development means that you not block anyone out. And you don't do that with a graphical design. You don't start with the graphic. You start with the structure. You start with the data. You start with what you want to achieve with that interface. Why should people go there? To read a joke? Cool. Display the bloody joke. Don't give them a button and a pop-up saying, like, please give us cookies first before you can see the joke and all the other things that we do to people out there. Making sure that people's data is safe is another very important part. And dealing with unknown content. Any CSS that people put into these chat systems right now and say, like, how do I make a 300-pixel wide box? And the answer should be, you don't make a 300-pixel wide box on the web. 
because it needs to, be, to cater for all the things that people put in there. It needs to be a, that much percentage or that much part of the screen. And every time I did it, uh, back in the days, like in, in, in when I started as a web developer in 1997, people gave me, uh, I lived in America, people gave me American designs and said, like, build this. I translated everything into, in, into German, sent it back to them and said, like, if that fits, we have a design because German is about that long compared to English. And that's a very, very good thing to test something with, just translate the thing and see what happens. And delivering experience as fast, as convenient as possible. So our job is to actually work on the, like, how fast does this show on the screen, how good it is rendering, how, how well it is actually achieved by the people out there. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, ChatGPT. It's everywhere, and it's exciting and newish way to create all kind of content. I mean, you probably all worked with it. You probably didn't live under a rock, and I don't want to be annoyed by annoying people who live under a rock. I'm okay if that's your lifestyle. But everybody heard about GPT, more or less, except for the German trains here in Berlin, because they called it GTP, which, of course, is another option of doing it, which was kind of ironic, seeing that many people are saying that uh, AI-generated content is full of errors, and then you got something here that probably a human has typed in the wrong way. Okay, I, I love that the heading, the headline went through, and even in the text, he did, in the second screen, uh, that was on the tube here, they also made the mistake, and the picture throws it the other way around. I mean, there's probably two editors and three writers involved in this, and this still happens. So how can machines not make mistakes when we make them all the time? So conversational UI is great. It lowers the barrier to access. People talking to the machine, or it's, it's so exciting right now to chat with something and like, oh, I got, a, uh, I got a party with five people, two of them vegan, what should I cook? And it gives me the things back. And then I keep talking to it, keep talking to it. It's like this addictive thing that we do with Facebook and other things as well, except this time we know it's a bot that we're talking to. Most of the time in Facebook, we probably as well, but we don't know it yet. It's highly engaging, it's really exciting to do because it's a new way to do it. And it also has a true sci-fi feeling. You know, it's like that enterprise thing where you like computer and like, oh yeah, I'm here, I'm doing something for you. But then again, it's also not that new. Because if you think about, I always like that, like shouting at the audience, like Siri, email my emails to my mother or something and see how many of them start up. Because we had, okay, Google, Siri, Alexa, Cortana. Uh, was it four years ago? This was the innovation. I remember when the Microsoft head was on stage and said, like, every app is going to be a chatbot. And yeah, they're not. They're not. Because if you think about it, when I use my Android phone, all I do is set an alarm for five minutes called Pasta is Ready. This is what we're using these things for. It's not the day to day interaction that we do that made our lives so much more effective. So, when it comes to the hype of, uh, of AI and machine generated and LLMs, I think it's time we get just move along and skip to the end and see where we're going. So I want to go more into a territory how we can be more effective with these things rather than be worried about it. So yes, AI will take our jobs. The boring, repetitive jobs, the jobs that don't need to be done by developers, the slideware, vaporware and prototypes or slides even, and web scraping and data cleanup. All that crap we need to do as developers, as junior developers, because we're underpaid and somebody says, like, do that, that frustrates us to no end. Let the machine do it. I'm happy with these jobs to go away. It's a really good thing we have those now. So let's focus more on productivity. You probably heard about the Gartner hype cycle. Like every new technology has always goes like this. So Everybody's excited about it, and everybody hates it, and then we start working with it, and then we actually realize what it really means. And with, uh, uh, with machine learning in development, this was in, within seconds. Normally, it took like three or four months with every other technology. But in this case, we're like, OK, developers are out of a job. Everything belongs to big corporations now. And then we looked at it and made it. Uh, the first thing that everybody does with a machine learning system, do something so it makes a mistake, so we feel good about it. So we're like, hey, hey, computers are stupid. <laughs> we're better than that. And then we're basically like, our computer makes the error, and then we work with it, and then like, actually, how can we use that? What can we do with it? It's going to be the interesting factor there. So the thing is, it started with a smart autocomplete. And I love that <laughs> in Excel, where you do like January, February, Marary, April, Mayary, and so on and so forth. Or even better was the, the glass is half full, the glass is half empty, or Excel says the glass is 1st of February because detecting of those things was not comparing it to other systems yet. We just did a simple automation thing there. 
And then the AI peer programmers came up. The first one was GitHub Copilot, and I've used that now for since its inception. I've, to, I've really well trained it myself. Code Whisperer came from Amazon later on as well. Ghostwriter AI mode is now acquired by Google. That was announced today. So Bart is going to use that one. And it was a really good system already. And keep checking. There's like 50 startups a day using LLMs for something, especially in Berlin. <laughs> and the initial criticisms and sensible worries are interesting. Is it OK for a paid-for system to provide results from the web? Like, I pay for some of these systems, and my content from Stack Overflow that I gave for free for the last eight years is going to be the content that it gives people. Is that okay? I don't know. What about the code license? Is it safe to use the results? We should be worrying about this. In some environments, you're not allowed to use any other code. Does it mean developers are obsolete? Uh, won't this promote ir irresponsible code and bad code? And what about unsafe code? And it cracks me up that we now start discussing that, because this has been out of bathwater for a long, long time. 2015, I wrote the Full Stack Overflow developer blog post, where I basically talked about the people that don't do Full Stack, but they do Full Stack Overflow. Every time we get stuck, we go to Stack Overflow, we copy and paste the first result, we change some numbers around. If nothing explodes, we submit it. And we've been doing that for a long, long time. And now the machine does it for us, and all of a sudden, it's a, it's a different thing. So it's worrying that we actually still work the same way. But the good thing about AI-generated code is that it also can detect that it was generated by an AI. We couldn't do that with like random copy and paste, or so people thought. More than, it's, it's actually much more than automated copy and paste. It's context recognition, style recognition, mimicking of the, of the style of your coding. It's code explanation, translation, and learning results. Learning results get better the more you use it, like the, the co-pilot that I had hardly gives me any errors anymore because I've been feeding it for two years what I want and not what I don't want. So the removal of discarded offerings means it's already not offering that to the next person, which is kind of a quality control. So context recognition is an interesting one, especially when it comes to front end. Uh, the other day I wrote this, I just had a table with a T hat and I said name, type, width, height, file size. So I had to do a list of images. And I had a JavaScript array of image names that basically it automatically generated from the folder. And the code that GitHub Copilot gave me automatically knew that in my HTML file, there's these headers in there, and gave me data, even dummy data, before I pulled the, the real one in. The name is the one that it actually found. The other one, it says, like, that has to be a file format, that has to be a width, that has to be a height. So it recognized from the HTML the context of what my JavaScript should be, something that I, as a developer, normally have to look up myself. Even more interesting was this example, where I just had a, a copy button on a list item, and I had a data snippet called, uh, uh, called test, and a copy as the text in there. So I then put that in there and just did, a doc, uh, just, uh, just did a, uh, an event handler. And it recognized everything. It realized that I probably have more than one LI in there. So instead of doing the event handler on the A, it actually did event delegation. It put an event on the snippets element itself. There's a, there's a, a typo in there. Uh, then it recognized, OK, I only want to act on it when the, bar when the button was, was clicked. I want not to follow the button or do the normal thing. And then I read the data set out. That is the data that I get. And I put it to the clipboard because it actually says copy. I didn't have to write any of that. GitHub Copilot realized that from my HTML, much like a good HTML structure should tell a real developer what to do with it as well. And GitHub Copilot realized all of that because I gave it the right HTML. And that's the context recognition that many people don't realize. It's also when you already have a big data set of a, a big a code set, it recognizes the content in there as well. So it says like in this case, I do a new function called remove list, and it found out that my local storage item was, re was called my tasks, the tasks, and the other one function was called update list. I put a key up in there, it realized I probably want to do an enter and then send it to there. Or if I give it a CSS name like overlay, it gives me the CSS to cover the whole screen. So by those things, uh, it's not just uh, uh, functionality that you would do in like Python or something like that. It realizes how to do that in a browser because it's been fed the right data already, and that's pretty nice. You have code explanation, so you can highlight a bit of code, like in this case CSS, and there's this weird percentage in there, and then you say, okay, Copilot, tell me what the hell that is, 
and it actually gives you a step-by-step -step instruction and telling you that percentage means it's a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. That's why that was, that was an old CSS hack. Several times when you generate it, you get different ones. And sometimes I even got comments in there, which blog post was that that, that invented that hack in what year? So this is really, really nice, and it's something that's coming into, uh, into almost all these systems now. This has been around in the, in the preview of, uh, of Copilot for like half a year now. Uh, code translation, you can, try, you can highlight code, translate it from one language to another. A bit of a minefield there, because there is no asynchronous PHP, but uh, it's still, it's a good start. And that's something we should all remember about these things. This is there to make our lives easier, not to replace all our work. It still needs a human to validate that what we tap in there is actually valid code and makes sense. Probably executing is a good idea as well. So what can a learning editor help with? It's detection of reusable code. If I actually, if every one of my team uses GitHub Copilot together, then my solution that I wrote is going to be sent to others as an, uh, as an option rather than something random from the internet. So this is really, really good for creating a code style in the company, for example, because the machine listens to you and gives it to the other users without you having to sit in a meeting room and write things on a whiteboard and say, like, we should use camel case. No, we should use this. We should use this. Just let the machine do it for you. Code standard definition, scaffolding generation, tooling tasks, things like uh, uh, unit tests, like the stubs for unit tests. You can do that with machine learning nowadays as well. You can do, uh, you can do all kind of like uh, structural things. You can write a schema and it generates the code for you. Getters and setters, why I never use Java. These can be automated now as well. It's really, really good to get all these boring things out there. And it works. There's a nice paper, uh, well, if you, bo if, if you like reading papers, uh, that actually showed that uh, people with Copilot were 55.8% faster than the other control group because they just didn't have to do the random stuff, going to, kit, uh, going to Stack Overflow and copy and paste by hand, but the machine did it for them. There was also considering other interaction models. Code brushes, I think, was a really cute thing that is in, the, in there right now in the preview of it. And what that one does is like, for example, I got my string length here equals rather than comparing. So if I highlight that code right now and I go to the code brush and say like, okay, fix that bug, it actually realizes that one equation sign is wrong. And when I say make it more stable, it actually does another case in there. I can document it automatically, and I can also make it more robust by checking, uh, by doing a try and catch around it. And I can create, uh, create basically things from it, uh, create types from it from that code as well. I like that little idea because rather than doing the tab auto completion that can feel uh, feel like jarring to you while you type, this is actually something like okay, let's fix that. So basically, like the the rubber stamp in in Photoshop used to be like let's fix the things around. We do that with code right now, and that's already in uh, in Copilot. Then the big woohoo ha the last few weeks were of course GitHub Copilot X being released. Um, Copilot X is just basically. Uh, um, an umbrella term for lots of tools that use the Copilot functionality and GPT-4 under it, and it's pretty imp impressive what it does. But it's similar things that were in the preview already. So there's now a chat inside Visual Studio Code or your other editors. It's just plug-in for every, almost edi every editor out there. You highlight the code, and then you chat with the, with the machine about it. So in this case, write a set of unit tests for that piece of code, and it creates the unit tests for you. Never ever put that on Twitter because you will get 600 testers writing you back that you should never ever do that and their jobs are safe and you shouldn't be, the computer shouldn't do that, but it's a starting point. All of this is a starting point, not the work being done for you. Documentation, chat, lookup. So uh, how do I vertically center a diff? You don't because in Japanese it goes downwards, so you have to center it to the side. So think about these things when you come to it as well. But uh, the problem with, with, uh, Ch uh, with ChatGPT and other systems is like you don't know the source. It basically could come from anywhere on the web. It comes from GitHub repos, it comes from Stack Overflow, it comes from John's cool website blog 1995. You never know what the, what the source is. So with the docs lookup that we have right now, and I got access to that one, uh, you basically can define only where you want the data, data from. Do you want to have GitHub docs? Do you want to get it from MDN only, from Azure only, from Webpack, TypeScript? So you only get the results from those repos from the proper documentation written by professional writers and not by random people saying, like, this is how you should do it and you shouldn't. 
By the way, best tip to get fast answers on the internet, never ask a question to people. Write some bad code and ask people what's wrong with it, and you get the best answers. It's so much faster than discussing with them what the best answer might be. People love to tell other people how wrong they are, so it's much, it's much easier to get, way, get information that way. Pull request generation is an interesting one as well, because as somebody who worked on a big open source project, we always got like empty pull requests. And we always created templates that basically would give you 90% of the job, but still people were just like, mm, get this, use it. I gave you my free time, do something with it. So the interesting bit here is that it actually is automated by uh, in the system in GitHub itself. So when you type something, you can say copilot, um, in this case, summary, copilot walkthrough uh, fixes number 47, so that will find the other issue, walkthrough, and then copilot poem because of reasons. And if you actually execute that then, and you run it in the thing, and uh, copilot does its job, it actually does explanations, gives you, gives you what, is actually, what actually happened in the code, and it do the explanation of, uh, of changes, and it gives you a walkthrough how to do that. So basically what we copied and pasted every single time when we did a pull request on something is now one single shortcut in GitHub Copilot, and I really, really like that. It's kind of good, kind of easy for them to implement it if it's the same system. Copilot for command line, uh, that's something I tweeted about yesterday because I got access to that one now as well, and that's really nice because, uh, I mean, I love the terminal. I, don't like Unix syntax, and I don't like reading man pages. Why man pages anyways? That's just a terrible thing. But what it does is basically you go to the command line and you do a question mark, question mark, and you give it a sentence, and then it creates the bash script for you that, fix it, that does that job and gives you an explanation bit by bit what part of that bash script does. You can run this command immediately, you can revise the query again, or you can cancel it. Uh, you can basically do it that way. This one now, uh, I asked it to resize all the videos in the folder to, uh, to 640 pixels with FFmpeg. I didn't tell FFmpeg, oh, I did say FFmpeg, okay, so I'm lying. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's an error in there, it wouldn't work, so I had to revise my query. So the next iteration of that would actually, I think would be good to tell you when it can't execute it. There's a wonderful NPM module called, how do I say that? The Fornicate, but in a shorter term. And that's an NPM package. If you wrote something wrong in Bash and you say, you write, fuck, then actually it gives you the real one because it actually realizes how close you were to the real thing. And I told them to wrap that in there so that might happen soon as well. <sighs> the other thing that Copilot X showed because it's cool for the for people out there is that it has voice recognition coming soon as well. So you can actually say, uh, uh, talk to it and code with your voice, which is an accessibility feature I learned, which is great because not everybody who wants to code should be able to type. Like some people cannot type and they still have probably good ideas how to program, but voice recognition of programming was absolutely terrible. And then of course there was this YouTube guy, like, I don't want to wait to try voice recognition on GitHub Copilot so I can code on the treadmill. I'm like, you overachieving wanker. I'm sorry, this is just what, you know if you're on a treadmill, be on the bloody treadmill. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna be coding because people pay you for coding, concentrate on bloody coding. That would be one thing to do. Like, do we don't all have to be like multitasking and doing the hustle on the side. This is a wonderful feature for people who cannot type. This is a great feature if I basically, my keyboard is dirty or doesn't work, which happens in MacBooks every two years anyways, then I can use that as well. But saying I would do double the work because I can talk to my machine now is something toxic that we as developers have to get away from. It's okay if everything gets automated. That means we don't have to do more work. It means we have to do more sensible work. We got more time to talk to our colleagues, to talk to designers, to talk to our product managers, to get the data in there, to make sure that it's compliant with German laws, of which are many. So it's a very important thing that we don't, don't take this as an opportunity to even more push into the, into the bad, toxic world of the cool program and it does and work and works and works and works. We all get older, we all got real life, so it, it, we need thousands of developers. We need millions of developers, actually, but we don't give them an environment, but a very environment that like, oh, you gotta be really hustling all the time, and I hate that kind of stuff. I don't know if it showed, but I don't like that, uh, for some reason. So machine-assisted code completion augments the work of developers. It doesn't replace it. So your job will become easier. Your job will become better, but 
it doesn't replace you. You shouldn't be afraid of it. You should start embracing it, much like we embraced color coding, much like we embraced automatic autocompletion with IntelliSense, much like we embraced that there's, there's one browser and one engine that can drive two browsers out there, or much like we realized like maybe we don't fix everything, but the end user needs to rechange things around as well. So I think there's a focus shift right now from writing code to reviewing code. So you write the code, the machine writes a lot of code for you and you have to look into it. Ironically, this is also what happens when you become a senior programmer or a lead programmer. You're not coding yourself anymore, you actually review code more and see what's missing in your engineers, what, where they can improve, what they can do better, where they need training. And this is what we all become. So basically, if, if one thing that happens with that automation is that we all become lead developers without realizing it because we're not writing the stuff all the time anymore, but we actually have more time to review our own code, and that's always a good idea anyways. The biggest skill is asking the right questions. I, I remember the, the, uh, the iRobot movie years ago where he met, he met Sefran Cochran here and didn't slap him, weirdly enough, but they just talked about, like, what, it was a broken interaction between him and, the, and that robot thing, which is a lot of times you see it as well. The LLMs and all the chat GPDs are only as good as the questions we ask them. And we should ask them taxing questions. We should ask them problematic questions and also write back when something is wrong because those machines are listening and they get better with our negative feedback. That's a very important thing to put into those machines and not just discard them. So prompt engineering will be a new big thing. It will be a big market that's happening right now. Like how do you use LLMs, how to use other systems, and how to write proper prompts. I found this LinkedIn training uh, yesterday about it. There's also a wonderful blog post about it. Um, we're going to send that, those links out somehow, I think. Uh, it's an interesting new field that, we might, that somebody starting right now might be wanting to look into. Same with like data scientists have become so much bigger than earlier than before. So to me, this is a great time to be a developer who cares about users and not about code. This is a great time to build stuff and let the machine do the boring vaporware stuff that we don't need. No, you don't need to build a joke website that has a button and shows a joke. That's something for a hack day, that's something for a fun project, but it's never going to be something that people pay for or shouldn't be, or if they pay for it, good, good on you, it's fine too. But it's fascinating that people think that an interface to code is what we really want. No, there's no one interface on the web. There's lots of users that have, have different needs, and you as the developer, designer, texter, product manager, have to think about that. So let's teach the machines by telling them what isn't useful and feeding, them, feeding the data set with great results. Let's be human, let's be unpredictable, and that's all I got, so thanks very much. If you have any questions, we'll take them right away. There was one from the internet that I found interesting as well. So, oh, there's an interesting question on the internet. It was the only one that it's was asked. Years. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody was wrong. Um, <laughs> there is a question about AI that says, how will we have new senior developers and architects in the future if junior developers are basically automated away? They aren't automated away. You still have to think about the impact of your code and the quality of your code. So the machine gives you code, but you as a junior developer has to learn, for example, where's an XSS injection problem, where's a SQL injection problem, how is that a performance issue? Because we, we're not quite there yet. We got great linting engines that actually tell us when we're doing things wrong, and I wrote one for VS Code for using all the edge functionality in there, but they're not part of those systems yet. We just announced Copilot for security as well for Azure, so that would be something. I want to, the next thing I want these machines to do is do the linting as well. And then again, being a senior and lead developer, maybe one less level is not a bad idea either. And I think the bigger problem is like, what do we do with when you reach senior? I was senior, then I was principal, then I was architect, and then I had to find something. That was in Yahoo back then. That's when I went to the backstage, which was our, our backend CMS system, and called myself developer evangelist. And people asked me what it was, so I wrote a handbook, and, and that was my title. So I had to invent a new role because I didn't want to go into people management. I wouldn't go into product management. There is a, a certain level where you are technical and you're not useful anymore or too expensive. 
I had several times in several companies where I could not do the job because I was too expensive, but I didn't have engineers to do it because I couldn't hire anybody because we didn't have any budget. So I was like a complete endless cycle. I think the, the uh, seniority in engineering is not about how much code you write and what code you write, but how, you, how your code impacts other people in your team and also the end users out there. This is where seniority and knowledge comes in, I think. This is beautiful. Honestly. Also, you can just use GPT to help you with a new job title. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, I talked earlier about it. It's, it's, it's so funny that you're like, oh, I can write three lines of code, write three lines of text and it creates a great email. And the other person then, I get a great email and use GPT to turn into three lines of text to say what that person talked about. <laughs> we actually, we're actually, we're actually getting ourselves out of the equation right now. The communication, the human communication happens in the machine rather well, than with us. Job. Yeah, I mean, I've done it with like job descriptions and also when I did my, uh, uh, when I had to do my job review, I hate writing about myself and it's uh, it, it, ChatGPD, the, not the internal one, the Microsoft one, but the outside one was actually really good scraping the web for me. I was also a musician in the Hamburg Philharmonic, which I'm not, but I'm, I'm happy to learn that if there's a good paycheck. But uh, that was basically interesting to see. It's, it's great to put your name in and see like write a CV for me right now. Uh, when you're applying for jobs, it's so formulaic by now. They expect the right words in there. And this is where uh, Bing Chat or GPT or whatever a system you want to use is really good. Casually dropping the bomb on internal chat GPT, by the way. Um, I didn't have access. Nobody in San, outside of San Francisco, I think, had. But yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you so much for attending. Does any of you have questions? We have one minute left. Yeah. According to beginning or end of the language. And Copilot will not have a lot of examples of that. And even if someone hears about this feature, it will still have much more older examples. Yes. So the, the question was also for the streaming people out there or the, the influencers, or I don't know. Um, <laughs> The question was like, how, how do new things uh, and important new changes to things like CSS and others come into Copilot? Does it actually offer the newest functionality or does it offer the most common one that is actually coming from the web is really outdated and old? Sadly enough, that's how LLMs work at the moment. That's why I said we need to be really good in flagging up bad results and actually writing better results and telling the machine to index them. There is no uh, way right now in these systems to actually say index this because it probably would be spammed to death, but I think we have to do better than that. That's why I like the docs lookup, for example. So if you use the MDN as the only resource where you look at it, you probably will get that information because a, a good writer of documentation will have put in there that margin also means that languages can go top down or left right or right left. So you shouldn't use the margin like we used to do it in 2000 one, but actually use the new margin ideas that we have right now. So uh, I think the only way we can make that happen is basically flag up as many bad results as possible. And it's great because when the machine makes a mistake, it makes us feel good. So we can complain about it. And when you tell the chat GPT that it made a mistake, it's not going to come to your house and beat you up because it's not going to take it badly. Whereas like if you disagree with people on the internet, it's another thing most of the time. Cool. All right, I guess. Handing over to the next AI person. Actually, we will have a very short five minute break for you to grab an additional snack and go to the toilet, which is out of the door, stairs down left. And I will leave you to contemplate before Jan gives his next session on the uh, choice of frameworks. Because actually, uh, you brought up Cunningham's law, which is the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, it's to post the wrong answer. There is uh, an XKCD that you all know that refers to that somebody being wrong on the internet. And with that, have a great break. Five minutes back here. See you then. And go to the bathroom first, then get food. Don't bring the food to the bathroom.
Same thing for you people in the stream. In two minutes, we'll be continuing with the next session of Mr. Jan Duval. Thank you. Another two minutes. Viele Leute online, weißt du das? Nee, äh, im Stream, weißt du das? Ist ja gut besucht. Oh, cool. Alright, alright. I will just. Huh? So near dran? No? No, okay, okay. We'll try that. Hello, everyone. I will now start my session. Uh, I'm Jan. I work at Microsoft. Uh, to the introduction, I'll, I'll say a little bit later. Um, and today I will be talking basically about 99 frameworks, and I can't choose one. A little bit about analysis paralysis, uh, if you've ever heard that term. And I hope to give you some guidance if you're new in the front end space to see how to get started and why I think that is a good way. And I'll also try to back it up by data. Um, and we'll go into the data because with data, sometimes there are also biases. So we'll look a little bit into that. And with that, I would like to get started and I would like to share my screen with you. And if everything works, hello, dear notebook, dear screen. So I sh we should be seeing my screen, we are. There we go. And basically, we can get started. Hi. Yeah, so basically, I already introduced you a little bit to the first slide. Um, before I introduce myself, I'll let you a little bit know a little bit of the content that I'm talking about today. Um, so first of all, we'll do a little about me. I would like to talk so that you know who I am, where I'm coming from, and why I'm telling you all these things. I'll also give you a little TLDR, just in case you don't want to listen that long. It's also fine. We'll do some expectation management, talk about the big three um, that I think they are out there right now, a little bit about the new kids on the block and why they are new kids. Some of them are not that new anymore. We'll talk about the data that I mentioned before. I'll try to do a little bit of live coding today. So to the demo guards, please be with me today. I'll also use our Bing um, chat because I don't have access to OpenAI and ChatGPT. So that's the next best thing I have. It's based on the same model. So we should get some nice results. I have a little backup just in case the live coding does not go that well. And afterwards, I will let you know a little bit about the going forward, what you can then do. and. Um, how I think front ends can be run today. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software engineer. I've been working in the industry for about 15 years. I've built um, databases. I've built backends. I've built front ends, everything in between. Some things I liked, some things I didn't like that much. I like the front end space. Um, if you look into the JavaScript world, it feels like there's a new library every day. 
uh, sometimes it's super hard to decide which way to go, especially with the front ends uh, that there are. Um, I used to do a lot of C Sharp. Nowadays, it's more JavaScript, TypeScript, and I'm working with a lot of customers. So sometimes it's Golang, it's other languages, a lot of Python. So that's a little bit more flexible nowadays than it was in my previous career. I'm also a scuba instructor. So if you want to learn diving, you can also talk to me. You might see me underwater sometimes. Usually, I, I swim with the head up. Here on the picture, I'm with the heads down, because sometimes you do stupid stuff. Um, and that's how it is. My life at Microsoft or my work at Microsoft, I'm a so-called cloud solution architect for application innovation. What we do is kind of like, I, I try to not say too many buzzwords, but that's the role. Uh, we do modern application development, break down monoliths. We do everything from serverless, containers, low code, no code, and a lot more buzzwords. We'll, we'll stick with that. And now we go to the basically the TLDR, because maybe I'm already boring you, you can't stand my voice, whatever. Um, what will I be talking about today? If you're getting started on the front-end space, you can't decide which way to go, pick React at the moment. That's my personal opinion. I'll show you later why I still say that, and there is some data out there. Um, but still, if you need a framework, um, around it that gives you a little bit more support because you want some decisions taken away, like how do I structure my code, how do I do certain things, how do I do routing and whatever is involved in modern front-end development, probably go with Next.js, it's a pretty good bet. If you want something and the new cool stuff, it's not that new anymore, you might have heard it if you're in the front-end space, it's Remix, I really like it, I, I think it's really cool and we're moving a little bit back into the direction that stuff is server rendered. So if you've seen that in the front-end space, we've been basically, before everything was rendered on the server, some HTML put to the client, then at some point we added a little bit JavaScript, we added a little bit more JavaScript, we added all the JavaScript to the front end, and nowadays we are moving back a little bit that some of the stuff goes back into the back end, and it's server rendered, some stuff is still front end rendered, it's kind of cool space to be in at the moment. Um, and then the most important thing, I think today, if you do a lot of JavaScript also in the browser, is actually use TypeScript. It's gonna save you a lot of time finding bugs and telling you already a lot of things. You can eliminate a whole bunch of errors just by using TypeScript because it warns you about all kinds of things. So that's something that I've seen in the past that I really enjoyed and it actually got me to do not that many dumb mistakes anymore. Still, I do dumb mistakes, but a lot less. Okay, so to the expectation management, um, this is the way I told you which ones to use. I have to disappoint you, it's not, because as always, it depends. It's a good start if you can't decide. They are solid picks, but of course, depending where you work, how you work, what you need, you might want to go for a different framework. Maybe Angular is your thing because you liked it, you have experience with it. It's also a very good bet and solid bet. And the next thing is, well, today I'm not gonna teach you everything and you're not gonna go out as a React hero. That's also something where I have to disappoint, but we'll talk a little bit about that. And just to make sure you're not gonna be an expert and this is not the only way, this is a way of doing it. So let's look at the big three that we have actually, and I would say they are the big three. There's always a discussion, things are moving, so maybe nowadays they are not the big three anymore. There should be the big four or five, I don't know. For me, that is still the way I would see the world in this space, and it's Angular by um, Google, which is a pretty cool framework because it has a lot of things already included, batteries included basically. You have testing included, you have, um, dependency injection and all kinds of cool things that you might need in a bigger application. So I've seen it used a lot in enterprises where they don't want to make that many decisions. Basically, take it and most of the stuff is already there and you don't have to do that many decisions. The other one is React by Facebook. Um, that one is more, I would say, a library and don't get me on the words. It's always, it depends how you define them. Why do I say it's more like a library? Because it comes and it doesn't have all these decisions already made. You have to decide how you want to structure your project. If it's going to be a large one, that might be a big decision and maybe you want to use something else where a structure is already defined so you don't have to do that. But it also gives you the flexibility of basically doing it as you like. 
So that's the cool thing. And there's also Vue.js that has been there for quite some time. Right now, I think we're on Vue.js 3, which is also pretty nice. Um, has a little bit different, um, I would call programming model, but it's also a very solid um, front end framework. I personally stuck with React. It was always that thing that worked for me. It clicked with me, so I stuck with it. I've seen other people that say, nah, never gonna touch React. I will always stay with Vue.js, and that's totally fine. It's a way. I'll repeat that a few more times today. Um, then there are some of the new kits on the block. I did not dive too deep into them. I only read about them high level and then pick some that I like. There's Alpine Jazz, there's Remix, as I mentioned before. Right now I think they have at least one, one and a half years history already, so they are not that new anymore. There's Svelte and also Solid Jazz, and um, if you ask around, there are always people that prefer this way or that way, um, but that's how it is. I would like to look now a little bit into the data that is out there, um, and it's from a report, the state of JavaScript. They do surveys, um, it's released every year. I think during the pandemic times it was not uh, every year, they, they skipped a year or two, and I wanna look at that and focus a little bit on the data they have, and why I said before, this is the way I think is a pretty solid way. Um, they don't include um, technologies that have less than 10% awareness, so not everything is in their data or in their charts. That's also something that you have to uh, think about. I will focus on two uh, main graphics, and one is the retention. Why do I care for retention? Because when I pick something, I would like to see do people actually stick with it, or is it just a hype at the moment? Because with hype cycles, you try not to go into a hype cycle, because then you might pick something that is super hyped today, and tomorrow you find out ah, it's actually not that good because it's missing this and that and that. So for me, it's always nice to see, okay, how long is it in the market? How long are people sticking with it? The other one is the usage, because the usage is like, still people might not like it, but they're still using it, so it has a very broad market um, where you can actually find stuff on the internet or the models that are trained with it, so you actually have the information out there. This is what I try to do because it prevents me a little bit of going into the hype cycles. When we talk about data, um, sometimes you might say, well, data is data, it can't be biased, uh, but this is actually very important to check where the data is coming from. So when I talk about this data from the surveys, even though there are a lot of people that are participated, um, the age group, you might not see it that well, but the age group is actually 25 to 34 years old, 35 to 40 years, uh, 44 years old. That's a pretty big part of this distribution. I'm right in there, so I might be in a bubble. If you look at the gender, I identify as a male, and I think it's uh, more than 70% of the people are male in there. Um, I am white, that's also somewhere in there, I think, uh, or not maybe, but also there are a lot of white people that answered actually this. So even though I base my decision on data, this data has some kind of a bias. So I might be in a complete React bubble at the moment and don't even know about it because everyone that I talk to is in the same bubble. So take the uh, things that I say a little bit with caution, also the data that I show, there is a bias with the data but it's the best thing that I found where I like to base my decisions on. So first of all, I'll start with the retention and the front-end frameworks and libraries. So here you can see React is actually, it started on all the way on the left side with 93% retention. You can look into the data, I linked it, hopefully um, you, the slides are shared, I think so. Um, and then you can also look up the data because I think it's very important that when we talk about data and decisions that we make on data, have a look at it yourself. So React is in a pretty stable way, it's been there for quite a long time. Retention, 83% is quite good for me to build something on top of it because I know that there's a lot of information probably out there where I can find stuff. There are a lot of other frameworks and things in there, but this is very important for me. The other thing that I mentioned before is the usage, and this is where it kind of gets interesting. So you see the retention seems to go down with React, but over the time the usage for React is basically always on the top with a very high usage. So that's why I would base my decision kind of like on this and say, well, I can go with React. The next th thing is, uh, for example, here, Angular, and then Vue.js, that's why I call them the big three, because 
it is basically pick any of them. There is some market share for it and you will probably find good solutions out there. I'm not sure how it's going to change tomorrow. You never know. Maybe there's uh, the next big thing um, out there and this might completely change. But at least I can kind of have a good decision and a good feeling about it that I'm not picking the very new thing where I don't know how it's going to work. That's how I do that. Um, the next thing is that I mentioned before, here it's not that clear, but I said actually um, if you want to have a framework or something like that, pick Next.js and hopefully you can see it here also. Next.js basically is all there all the way on the top. It's been there for quite some time, so it's probably not a bad pick if you go for that. Also here, um, that's the retention. Also the usage basically has gone up. It's very highly used, so that's quite interesting. There's also Gatsby in there, which personally I've tried. I didn't like it too much. I found it too complicated, but maybe it's your thing and you like it, go for it. There's basically, you can't do much wrong. It's just something how I would make the decision. Um, and also Remix is in there. I don't know, I think it started 2021. Uh, it's been there for quite some time. If you've worked with Spot, uh, not, uh, Spotify, Shopify, uh, they bought Remix, which is kind of interesting. So they are supporting that framework. Um, and it's, they built their web shops and, and stuff like that with it. Pretty cool to see. Um, why did I say TypeScript? Well, if you look at the JavaScript flavors here that are used, there are some out there, but well, TypeScript is quite dominant in that area, and that's basically why I would say try and go with it. It's a, also a solid pick. And now we do the interesting part that uh, will get interesting for me because we have to see how it works. Um, we'll go into the live coding, and Chris, uh, Chris has already said it before, sometimes the boring jobs go away and we can use AI to do the bootstrapping part for our applications. So since I said I don't have access to ChatGBT, but I have access to Bing Chat, so I will use that and try to show you a little bit how I use it in some of my daily work and um, what it can spit out, where it's kind of interesting, where you still are forced as an engineer or as a developer to review the stuff and see how it actually works and what you want to do with it. So first of all, I'm always friendly to my AIs. I don't know why I say hi, I say thank you, I say please. Um, it kind of feels weird, but if I ever end up as a battery or already am a battery, please treat me well, dear AI. I try to do the same. Hi, today we want to build a demo app and I will give it a persona. I will actually say, hey, you are a web developer and you use, sorry? Right now you got a developer. Oh, let's see how it, uh, um, you are a web developer. Thank you very much. You use TypeScript, uh, React, and of course we want to use CSS3. Let's see how that goes today. Yesterday it worked quite fine. We'll see how it goes today. Okay, so we give it a little bit persona, we try to give it a little bit of context, and then we see what it's gonna put out. Okay, thank you very much, please sign in again. We'll copy this one, I've been on the page for quite some time. Please be kind, we'll try this again. This is why sometimes you should not do live coding, but I still wanted to do it because I find it kind of cool. And okay, hello, happy to be, what do we wanna do? So right now I'm, I'm gonna build a dummy app. I just wanna demonstrate how it actually can do from text to a real app. So what I wanna do, hi again, oh no, not hi again. Uh, we would like to build an app. The layout should have, a, we usually have a header in our applications. Uh, on the left side in the header, I would like a logo, a header, uh, in the header, a logo on the left. In the middle, we want some links, like an imprint about me, something like that. Uh, in the middle, I want two links. One, two, about me. One, two, the imprint. Uh, and on the right side, some dummy text. 
let's see what that happened. That sometimes gets funny. Um, in the main area, just some lorem ipsum and a footer with a copyright. Of course, we need a copyright, right? So let's see what's going to happen today. Pretty exciting because it, it worked out really well the other days. Uh, I see. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I told you so. Yes. Okay. We'll see. Didn't ask me that yesterday. So now it's searching for a React tutorial, best practices for building a website. Sounds not too bad. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No, not like that. Okay. Could you please build this app for me? I have some prompts, otherwise we try to copy and paste them. <laughs> yeah, that's also something we can do. I'm sorry, but I cannot build that app for you. However, I can. I have a backup folder. I'll reload you again, dear friend. Sorry? Could be. Could, good idea. Could you give me the code? Let's see, attempting to reconnect. <laughs> I'm having fun today. And no worries, I have a backup. I have everything there where I can go through the things. Mm, very thing. Okay, stop responding. Don't like you today. And you don't like me. Yeah, well, we'll try again. As I said, I have a backup that worked yesterday, but these tools, they change a lot nowadays, uh, which is interesting. <laughs> and sometimes, uh... okay, so this is what I tried yesterday. And it worked really, really well. You have to trust me. Um, how can I help you with your application? Let's see. I should have copied the other prompts and then actually compare them and see why some of them worked and some didn't. That's the interesting part. And that's why we're getting into this prompt engineering. Because depending on how you frame it and how you ask it, it gives you different answers. And some are good and some are not that good. Maybe today, thank you very much for all this text, but that's not what I want. <laughs> Do you please, oh, I love demos. Do you please show me how to do no. this? <laughs> well, at some point. <laughs> I, I, Actually, nice, there we go. So we have to ask pretty please, and then it actually goes into this direction, which I, but see, this is the interesting part, and that's why we are talking about prompt engineering, because I, I basically asked it the same question before, but I used different words, I phrased it differently, and didn't respond, and now it actually outputs quite good code. Um, and it has everything in there that I actually wanted. I copied now the, the stuff from yesterday where I already put in that I want to get the stats for a GitHub repo. That's why you can see a little bit more. I, I'll explain it in a second. But it's actually a super interesting uh, demo. I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised myself that I could convince it to do this. and. Now I'm really sad that I didn't copy the prompts from before because that's interesting. Okay, I prepared the app a little bit so I bootstrapped a little app um, just to be able to copy and paste it because right now I don't have Copilot X where I actually would have the chat inside of VS Code where the integration is a lot better. So I still have to do some copy and pasting but that's okay. That's my part of reviewing it um, and it's, it works quite well. So first of all, we'll copy our header component. If you're familiar with React, the interesting part is already it spit out actually two different components. So it's not giving me just a mess of code. It's still not ideal, but it already started to have smaller components in it, which is pretty interesting. And in our little apptsx, uh, I only have a hello world in there. It's running. I can show you in a second. We'll input the header component, we are not using it. And in the main component, I can just copy and paste this part. Hopefully it's gonna work. Um, and this is the part 
where you actually have to review stuff and where you still have to know a little bit of what you're doing because otherwise it's like copy and pasting from Stack Overflow. Right now, um, I can make this a little bit bigger. There are some um, wiggly lines here because I didn't import all this stuff because I actually didn't copy the um, import because we need some libraries. Um, I'm just assuming that most of you are probably familiar a little bit with imports. It's the same concept in a lot of programming language. You import something so you can use it. Here we are using something from React. And if everything goes well and we have everything in here, here uh, I will explain in a little bit what we see there. And basically here we already have the stars and the app is running. So that is what I like about it because bootstrapping this part, it's a not very complex app but at least it's already calling an API, it has multiple components, so for me I saved a lot of time, I don't have to read all the documentation, I do not know or I do not need to know exactly how the API works to get started. If I want to do something special now and extend it, it becomes a little bit more tricky because then I have to be into it. Okay, um, it's not displaying our header, right? So that one we are missing, what did we do wrong? Um, because here it's the stats. Did you give me a main component or something like that? No, you just put it like that. I have to put it together. So even though it spit out the right components, it didn't stitch them all together. That's the part I have to do and that's part of my review. I don't see the header, so we have to input it here somewhere. We'll input it here. Um, in React, if you don't know, you can only have one child here, so we have to have a little bit of a dummy child and we'll input the header. And there, if you've not seen it, that was already co-pilot there telling me what I need to do here. It's not that interesting. Now I have a little header. Huh, this looks not very nice and I guess it doesn't have, oh, today it didn't give me the CSS part about it. Interesting, yesterday I even got CSS that I could copy and paste. Now you see it's not very usable here. Hmm, you forgot the CSS. You forgot the <laughs> CSS part. Could you please give it to me? Pretty please? Let's see what it says this time. <laughs> ah, there we go. And it's spitting out a little bit of CSS. We'll just copy and paste it to see what's gonna happen. Um, I'm not an expert in CSS, so that's why I'm kind of happy. Here it even tells me, it splits it even up for the two components. Um, so the first one here is for the header part with the links and everything, and the second part is for the main area. So we'll just copy and paste it all into one file because it's just a demo. Um, and I'm not an expert in CSS. Chris can probably tell us if this is good stuff or not later, not now, because then I get confused. I'm already confused by this AI here. So let's see what happens if we have this in here. We saved it, we'll take the main part. So it's like engineering job as always. You go to Stack Overflow, you copy and paste stuff and then something works and you're happy, you get money, you go home. All right, and basically here, now I even have the header, I have the CSS, everything is huge because I have a little bit bigger font. I wanted to reduce that font. And it's basically working. So I have Bootstrap, the little application that calls an API, and I don't need to know much about actually how to do it. I have some experience with React, I have to say, so I kind of know that this probably is going to work when I copy and paste it. But for people that do not have the experience, it's a super good starting point because you can copy and paste it, you can go back and forth, see what is working, why are things not working. Um, with the header part, that might be a little bit tricky for people to see why is it not working. I have everything in there, why is it not working? Um, so then you still have to do some digging. So I'm pretty sure our jobs are not going to go away completely, but hopefully the dumb stuff goes away. And for me, dumb stuff is writing CSS. Don't tell that to a designer. They like that. They do awesome stuff with it. And um, I did, did not bash on designers. They are awesome people because they take away the skill I don't have, making stuff very nice, very usable. I'm just not good at that. But here you see basically what you can do with it. Um, I have to check the time because I think I'm getting close to the end. So I'll stop the demo here and switch over to something. Are we going to do that? No. I'll try the next prompt actually because before, because this page is quite boring because it doesn't, 
tell me which repository are we actually using or getting these stats from. Um, and we'll just ask it to put in the name and see if it actually can change our code from before. So this is where it becomes interesting because it has a context of the whole conversation. So I'm kind of now asking, hey, can you refactor it and put something else in there? And it actually can do that. And it's nice and it this time spits out the code again. So very nice. Next time I'll try to tell it, hey, please, can you always give me the code and not just links to stuff? Um, and the change now is here, this one. I could again go and copy and paste it, but for me, I know what I wanted to do. So I just take this line, add it over here. And this is where I'm really excited and really looking forward to the integration with um, Copilot and the chat. I think it's Copilot chat, what it's called, uh, because then I don't have to copy and paste it myself anymore. I actually can, the AI take over or the tooling around it take over that job and even that stupid copy and pasting goes away. Still have to review it and make sure everything works. And of course it's not working. Did we save it? Did you reload it? What did we forget? Stats name, is it called something else? Sorry? Here it's not in here, right? Yes. Exactly. And I should have copy and pasted it before because it probably made more changes than I was aware of, right? And thank you for that uh, note. It actually here also put in some more data from the API. And if we go on, um, now we should actually see something and I'll explain you. So there actually we see something. We could now go into asking it to actually create us an input where we can change the repository where we get the data from. That also worked yesterday. So I'll try that quickly. And then I'll switch over because we're running out of time. The demo took a little bit longer because we had some unexpected things that were happening. Um, so basically now I'm asking it to give me an input um, field where I can then change the name of the repository where we get the data from. Um, and here you go. And I even ask it for a rounded input, right? Because uh, round things are always um, awesome. And are you gonna... Uh, it's doing it a little bit different, so there it didn't relate to our context anymore, and it forgot the CSS again. <sighs> ah, no, there it is. It's inline this time. So you see, sometimes it's inline, it's not putting it. Hmm. Can you put the CSS in an extra file? Good question. Could you please put the CSS in an extra file? I'm being polite, please. Sure, there we go. Mm, that's the whole CSS again. Let's see if it knows about the rounded input also. That's the header CSS. We already know that part. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Can you do with this quicker? <sighs> Falling asleep here. I'm running out of time. Go faster. <sighs> and another file. <laughs> So now it's stating all the code again. I could copy and paste it again. But you basically get the gist out of it. You can actually ask it to re kind of, it's not really refactoring, but you can ask it to extend it, to put stuff here and there, and actually works for us and can take away, it didn't put the CSS in the extra file, the round input is missing, yeah, la da la da la da. Thank you very much. Um, but you get the gist of it. You can copy and paste it, and the integration gets better, and the tooling gets better, and it's gonna save us a lot of time, especially in this bootstrapping. Um, for someone that is experienced, writing an application like this is probably quite easy, but for people that are not experienced, this might take quite a bit of time, and we can take away a little bit of this stupid researching time, having 20 tabs open, um, and then doing the boring stuff. So that's what I kind of like about it. I'm pretty happy that it worked out after a little bit starting challenges quite well. So. Now I will continue on the slides. I didn't go through all of the things that I uh, wanted to go through, but that's not too bad. Um, so I'll skip some parts from our session here. We'll go back to the demo. What I actually wanted to show are a few concepts um, that I like to use in, in React. One of them is prop drilling. Prop drilling is where you give properties from a very high component, always deeper, to somewhere else. And sometimes, if you've developed React, you might have seen that, that you pass a name from the first component to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, to the blah, 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 uh, because you need it somewhere down here to display something up there. Um, 
Today I couldn't show it, so hopefully if you ever have that problem that you pass on components or data from component to component, prop drilling is the thing that you try to avoid. There are also some other things that I'm not going to go into because I couldn't demo them today. Well, I, I kind of liked the demo, but it was not as expected. Um, how do we go forward from this? Because having a simple application like that is usually not what we want because from there we want to extend it. So in the React area, there are some things that I really like to use for um, async calls, use React query. That's a really cool library. I wanted to do it in the demo too because there I could have also shown a little bit how the AI actually fails because it's pulling in old data and it doesn't work because there's a new version of the library already out there and you actually have to do the adjustments and that's where it gets tricky and that's where I'm kind of happy and my stop job will still exist because these models will always be a little bit behind the reality for some time. Hopefully they'll never be in front of the reality, I hope. Um, something that's also very important that uh, Chris talked about is um, accessibility. And accessibility in front ends and in React to do sometimes is super hard because there are a lot of things you have to think about. There's one great library, um, it's called React Aria, it's from Adobe, and they have accessible components like models, like buttons and all these things because there's a lot, especially if you are not specialized in that area, there's a lot of things that you can do wrong and these libraries take that a little bit away. They come very bare minimum and only do the interaction part, adding some ARIA labels for example and making sure it's accessible. You still have to do the design and everything. I'm not a very good designer. I, um, I can make things look blue, green, red, you know, the default colors. Uh, I'm running out of time. So I still like to use Bootstrap. I know it's a library from years ago, but still it has very simple components that are sty styled quite nicely and you can get up and running pretty fast. Utilities, Lodash. If you do state management, there's awesome library, Redux Toolkit. Just an idea. Try to avoid state management, it's hard. Um, one thing that I've seen done a lot of times very wrong is that people, when they build single page applications, they put API keys in the code. Very bad idea, why? Single page application, everything is running in the browser, all of a sudden your API key is in the browser. That's something you don't want because from there, people have access to your JavaScript, they can read it, API keys never go in the browser, they go on the server side. If you need to call a third party, you have some kind of a backend that calls the third party and there you make sure it's secure via the API key. Then of course comes authentication, authorization, a lot of fun. How can we actually host the stuff? There are a lot of ways. One thing that I really like as a product of us, I work at Microsoft, so I kind of like our products, um, is Azure Static Web Apps. It can get you get started for especially these kind of things, single page applications, have some APIs behind it. Um, super cool, very lightweight, easy to get started with. Everything is there, even if you want a GitHub integration, everything is there click, click, done, and you even have pipelines for it with automated deployments, pretty cool. Of course, there's always the thing running in containers. You can also go a full custom way with front door, CDN functions, do whatever you want. That might be interesting if you need to customize a lot of stuff. But for most people, getting started, Azure Static Web Apps is pretty nice because it's all in one, um, and I really like that product. And that's basically it. I would say thank you very much. I'm kind of on time and thank you very much and I think we're going to break now or questions exactly we'll start with the questions we have uh, two rather brief yes no questions online and then perhaps I would say let's have <laughs> two or three questions from the audience here because everything else would be a bit unfair after that we'll be having the break with both vegan and non-vegan currywurst outside. I would uh, like to limit it to 15 minutes, really, so we can have our next session in time-ish. Um, the web questions were two things. Uh, the first one was, would you use the new Next.js with API routes uh, on production already? Uh, good question. You can if you want to. There is some notes in the documentation you might should not to, so it's basically up to you. I'm kind of 
like you've seen, I do live demos, so I don't have to, problems to put stuff into production. If I think it works, I'm going to put it to production. But if you ask me from a customer perspective and on my real guidance, I would say don't do it. I personally would do it because, yeah, why not? You've seen the live demo, right? Yeah, and the second one uh, is about Blazor for front and web development. Yep. Any thoughts on that? Uh, very interesting stuff I didn't go into yet because I have a JavaScript background, so I have a very strong React background. Um, I'm starting to touch Blazor at the moment. It's very interesting. I like it, but I've personally not seen it uh, being used with my customers yet. And that's sometimes I don't go into the technologies my customers are not using. I would have to ask around. But it's interesting technology, uh, and it's it simplifies stuff because it brings stuff again together in in. Uh, one area with the JavaScript, you always have to split it to, like nowadays, if you build front ends, you have a different build system there. So with Blazor, it's a little bit more integrated, and I will try it out. I have not yet, so I can't say too much, but give it a try. Let me know. Thank you. And we have one question from the in-person audience. Yeah, you said accessibility is complicated and hard, and I say, no, it's not. It's HTML. It's, uh, well, yes, you're right, but there are a lot of things um, that you can do wrong. That's what I mean by um, complicated. So yes, at the end of the day, it's all HTML. It's also very well documented. But if you think about if you really want to make it accessible, like personally, when I've tested web applications, I usually test them with a the mouse. I test them on my computer, which is pretty fast. I live in a country where most of the time, if you're not traveling by train, you have pretty good internet. Um, so it's very unfair to test it, and I can do a lot of things wrong. And I have hands. I'm, I'm, I'm capable to type. Um, I don't test on touch devices. So I already do a lot of things wrong in testing. That's why I think you Thank you for correcting me. It's not complicated. It's just a lot you have to think about. So that's the way better term there. It's not complicated. It's just a lot you have to think about. Thank you. If anybody wants things done wrong, uh, hit me up. I'm available on LinkedIn. Any other questions from the audience? Well, ah, OK, fair enough. Maybe more out of interest uh, about uh, Bing. Um, yeah. What's the name? Bing? Bing Chat. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, tool, the, the tool you are using. Uh, under that, it's a different model than ChatGPT, right? Uh, no, I think by now it's the same model behind it. So I think they are both based on Chat or on, on GPT on the Model 4, I think it is. But there, I'm, I, I'm not an AI person. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty confident, let's put it that way, that it is the same model at the moment. OK. And you choose uh, today using Bing? Because, it's because a Microsoft product. Right? Well, because there I have the Bing Chat and I don't have access to the ChatGPT. Otherwise, I might have used ChatGPT. And yes, I use Microsoft products. I work at Microsoft. So again, there there might be a little bit bias in in the things that I choose. But I I kind of like it and um, it gives me the experience. Um, so yeah, I, I choose uh, Microsoft products. I work at Microsoft. There's kind of a correlation there. No, but seriously, uh, actually, Bing has been using GPT-4 for uh, the last month, since December already. Uh, we published that information a couple of days ago. So it is the real GPT-4 that you are using in the Bing chat. Perfect. Thank you. All righty. We shall have 10 minutes of feasting, very, very fast feasting, I hope, uh, and meet you back here. Thanks a ton. Thank you.
Boom. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to see that while we've had the most damaging dinner possible, none of you has any currywurst stains. You're brilliant people indeed. For the next round, did you, you double have... check that? No, I didn't. For your sake, you're welcome. Uh, for the next round, we have Stefan Judis from Checkley with us who will give a session about playwright and end-to-end -end testing, the way I understand. We only have one more session after this for tonight, so I see you have tons of material for discussion and conversation. Uh, we won't throw you out of the building right after the last talk, so uh, please feel free to stay and socialize afterwards. But for now, Stefan Judis. All right, everybody, thank you for being here. I want to kick things off with a little bit of a history lesson. Ready? Does anyone remember this thing? Five? Six? Six-ish people? So this, oh, and I'm, 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 I'm not allowed to move, so I have to be very stuck here. So um, this was uh, Phantom Jazz. Uh, I don't know when that was, like 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, I was terribly excited about this because it was one of the first JavaScript-driven projects that allowed me to control a browser. And JavaScript people, like myself, went nuts with it and was like, okay, now I can scrape things, I can screenshot things. The entire front-end community kind of went all in on this because it was JavaScript, you were able to control, headless WebKit, and kind of opened up this whole browser tooling space for me. Let's continue. Does anyone know what this is? Casper for once. So that was a layer on top of Phantom Jazz. You see, we had a thing for ghosts at the time, uh, and it was basically the idea: let's use Phantom Jazz to build up an end-to-end -end testing suite using Headless WebKit and kind of start establishing end-to-end -end test flows. And these were the things when I started doing end-to-end -end testing for the first time um, using JavaScript using Headless browsers. 
So let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Stefan. I'm here from Berlin. I work for a company that is called Checkly. We're also based in Berlin here. We do synthetic API and browser monitoring. And this leads me to talk about Playwright because we also offer that running in the cloud wherever you want to. And this means that I can play a lot of uh, times with browser automation. And I'm also um, a Playwright ambassador, which means I have fancy Playwright socks, which is always cool. Um, so this is me, and I'm from Berlin, and I write a tiny newsletter. If you're interested in front-end in front -end news, <laughs> in front stop moving, Stefan. In front-end news, so web weekly email, I, I send that out once, uh, once a week if you are into front-end stuff. But let me tell you, in general, I always thought and still think that the idea of end-to-end -end testing is great. Right? Because you can test your front end, you can test your hosting, you can test your database, the entire stack. You can mimic that the behavior that your users will have when they visit your products and sites. But to be fair, when I wrote my first end-to-end -end test, it was terrible. Honestly, I didn't enjoy it very much. And the worst spot that you can be in when you start end-to-end -end testing and you put a lot of effort with your team into it, sprint over sprint over sprint, you're working on this, and then you end up with something like this. That you have a test suite that runs 30 minutes an hour, that you don't enjoy writing because it's so painful, and then at the worst stage is that you want to push out this one type of fix to production, your end-to-end -end test running an hour to give you false positives, and you run it again. This is the situation that I had for several years, like 10 years ago. I wasn't very happy. My team was not very happy. Also, engineering management wasn't very happy because your team or the team spent a lot of time end-to-end -end testing just to be slowed down. That, that didn't make a lot of sense. Eventually, you might come up with a solution to this problem. So we said together that as a team multiple times was, we should only run our tests on demand, right? when we do a big refactoring, when we do a huge th thing that really makes us uncomfortable. And let me tell you, this is the moment when all the sprints and all the effort and all the work that you put into your end-to-end -end testing stuff goes out of the window. Because when you're not testing constant, uh, constantly, when you're not updating your tests, at some point you will just say, okay, this is too much work, let's put it up. Over the time, though, I think things got a lot better, right? Google invested in uh, Puppeteer to control Chrome. Um, was a solid step. Then Cypress appeared five years ago um, with solid developer experience. It kind of felt like Cypress took the entire space in a few years. It was a very, very nice experience. But you might have um, guessed that already. I do think that there is a tool from Microsoft here um, that the communities are not talking about enough, and that is uh, Playwright, and I think it's two years old, a little, a little more, I'm getting not here from, from one Playwright core member. Um, so it's two years old, and let me just give you a brief introduction of what Playwright is, why I think it's great for end-to-end -end testing, and then I'm going to do a little bit of end, uh, demo to show you all the goodness that comes with it. So first of all, Playwright is cross everything, Chromium with Edge and Chrome. You can control this. You can use uh, WebKit with the Safari. You can use Gecko with Firefox. It works on all three operating systems. And you can write it in five programming languages, so JavaScript, TypeScript, .NET, Python, Java. If you're running in a not JavaScript language, you can write Playwright 2. I'm a JavaScript hipster, right? So I use JavaScript and TypeScript. If you're in the Microsoft universe and you're using VS Code, there comes a VS Code extension which means when you are using VS Code to debug your applications already, it's just another button there that you can use to um, control your headless tests. Speaking of developer experience, it comes with very, very solid typings. Right? I do enjoy it when I don't have to read docs, when I can just plug away, tap, 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 and my editor is telling me when I mess things up. So kudos to the Playwright team, because I think the typings are very, very nice. And now that I'm using Playwright for over a year, it took me actually a few months to realize that Playwright is not just a puppeteer competitor, because it is way more than a browser control. So Playwright these days comes with all the test goodies that you're expecting from the testing software that you already have in place. You have test hooks, you have expect functions, assertions, de describe before each, after each, 
All this thing that you might be already familiar with is included. And speaking of these long end-to-end -end tests that run for an hour, parallelization is built in. So you can set a command line flag, you can tweak it in your config, running multiple browsers at once in different processes is pretty much just a config step away. And it is built for quick execution. So when you think about the idea of end-to-end -end or UI testing, what is it? It is find an element, do something with an element, find another element and wait for this element to have a certain state. This is pretty much UI testing. And what that usually meant is that you had to place several wait for statements all over the place, right? Wait for this button to be there, click it. Wait for this model to be there, do this. All this functionality is built into Playwright itself. So for example, when you see there this button click, what this is doing under the hood, it is waiting for this element to be visible, actionable, not moving, um, there are a few checks that are happening and you will find in Playwright a lot of patterns where you are dealing with asynchronous behavior that looks synchronous, right? This is not a button click. This is waiting for this button to be visible, actionable and then clicking it. The same goes for the assertion below there. This is not a single moment where you check, hey, is this thing right now hidden? It is Playwright waiting for this element reaching the state to be hidden. So what that means that you can drop a lot of wait for statements and you can just instruct Playwright, hey, this is what I want to do. This is the state that I expect. And this leads to less flaky tests and you can just give it to the framework, right? It will figure it out. And will time out if the UI doesn't reach the state that you're expecting it to. Another thing that I do enjoy very much is the fast release cycle. Um, so once, once a month there's a new video and a new version, roughly once a month. And there hasn't been a single release over the last six months where I was not like, hmm, this is actually pretty, pretty nice. I was waiting for that. And this is good additions. So and as I'm now eight minutes in, I think showing is better than telling. So let me just take my clicker away and let me walk you through how you can set up a Playwright project, how we can start testing stuff. And let's see how I will make it through this session. And I don't see my mouse. This starts great. OK. Is that big enough or can I make it a little bit smaller for the people in the back? Does that also work for my sanity? OK. So what we have here on the right is my terminal. And I will instruct Playwright over there. And what we have here is a standard Playwright project. I will close everything out. So there's a Playwright config, which you get when you bootstrap a new project. And here, if you wonder what this little face palm thing is, this is just my backup in case I um, mess it up. And then we have a test directory that includes Playwright spec JS. When you have Playwright installed, you can, over the command line, do npx Playwright, Playwright tests. And what we are running against is this site here, which is the Playwright docs. It is not running on the internet, though. It is on my local host. <laughs> And I don't see my mouse. That is a little bit annoying, but we see how this goes. And then we have a test file here that requires tests and expect from Playwright itself. And in the before each, we are already navigating to localhost 8080. So the first step to get started with Playwright is pretty much just by using something that is called CodeGen. And this, when I saw this for the first time, really blew me away. So what you see here is now that we started a browser session. And I have what is on the right side, the Playwright inspector. And what I now can do is I can just start clicking around here and check out what, what is happening on the right side. So I'm opening the Algolia search, I'm closing the Algolia search, I'm going back to home, and here we have our first Playwright test. All that I can now do is I can go back to my terminal, I can call that, and here I have a test that is called random click around, right? So let me just paste that over. Let me close the navigation, save that, and congratulations, we just recorded our first Playwright test. So what I now can do is I can run and play npx playwright test. And just to show you what is happening here right now, let me just run in head full mode so that we see all the browsers. So when we kick this now off, we see the Chromiums appear, we see the um, Firefoxes appear, we see the Safaris appears. It's all the browsers running in full mode here right now, testing the website, uh, my local host 8080. And you see it here right uh, on the happening or on the right side. But you see that, well, this test was now failing. And why is that? Well, for the test cases of mobile Chrome and mobile Safari, when we look at the site that we're actually testing, 
well, the nav bar is behind a nav, uh, hamburger or a, behind a button, right? So this test is failing because we're running on a mobile viewport. To fix that, let me just go quickly go to the Playwright config. Here we have the configuration for all the browsers that we have. And I will just go on with Chromium going forward, which means when I now run the tests again, let's run in headless mode, we should have five tests that are easily passing and everything is good to go. I already briefly showed you the show report. So every player test here comes with a report, which you then can use to really have a look at hey, what is happening, what is failing, what is my test really doing. But this is actually only the beginning. So let's have a look in my notes what should be next. What else do we have? We have the VS Code extension. So I'm using VS Code. You see that I have a few little triangles here. VS Code debugging is your kind of jam. You can always do debug tests. And what you now see is that you can reuse the debugger of VS Code if you want to. So we see how we have access here to the variables, to scoping, all these kind of things. So if you're using VS Code for debugging already, I think this is a very nice experience. So we see here we're on Playwright library. We're now on the Algolia window. So I think that's a, that's a nice way to debug your stuff if you have more complex or longer tests. I do, I have to admit though, that I do prefer to debug my tests outside of VS Code. So what I tend to do is I spin up the same tool that we already saw. So here we also have the debugger that we can use to kind of have a look and what my test is doing. And what I think is cool is when you're running a Playwright debug, you will see that Playwright is actually telling you, hey, this is going to happen. And I'm interacting with this element. So that makes it very reasonable to have a look at what is going on. There we have that. And did anyone use Playwright already? A few people. What was one of the most requested features of Playwright? One of the what? Of the most requested features of Playwright? What? You said regressive? requested? Requested. What did people want? What did people want? I, I wanted to take auto replay. What is autoplay? Auto replay is like Cypher does when you change the code, it automatically reruns the exact. The well, there was a release last week. This, <laughs> <laughs> this is now here. So what you can do is you can run NPX Playwright tests with a UI flag and now you have a UI flag element. So basically, I hope I understood you correctly. There's now a native UI for Playwright. And what you can do is you can enable the watch mode here. And whenever you save something, Playwright will continue running, right? So when I now do this, you can have this watch mode and can run your tests without running it manually all the time. So you can then dive into this. You see all the instructions. I think it's a beautiful way. And what still astonishes me is that when you see these preview windows in the Playwright tooling, this is not a screenshot here. This is actually an HTML snapshot, which I think is pretty decent. Oh, pretty cool. Um, all right, so with this, I just covered very quickly the tooling of Playwright, but I think it should be that we could, should kick it off and should start actually some tests. So let me just go on and let's kick on off a code gen session again. And what I want to do is I want to test the little toggle here, right, if dark mode works properly. So I'm copying both, both selectors here. I have here a test that is called toggle correctly. And I think there's a bug in the Playwright docs because the text here is not changing after I clicked it. That could be that that is my local um, installation, but when you're doing headless testing, especially if it's visual, what you usually want to do at some point is you want to do screenshots, right? Um, I don't see myself doing that that often um, with Playwright, but let's say we want to do home dark PNG here, and then we want to have another screenshot for home light PNG. So when I now run this, PX Playwright tests, we should go be able to go to my directory and here we have the two screenshots, right? This is not as exciting, but what comes with Playwright 2 is what you can do is you can also tie this to assertions. So let me just use an await expect which comes from Playwright itself on top. And what we can do is we can give it the page object and we can say to have screenshot over here. And this is built in visual regression testing coming with Playwright. So when we now say that we expect here to have an image that is called home dark PNG and we want to do, oops, and we want to have home light PNG over here, I can remove these two images that I just used for debugging right now. And we can actually 
do some visual regression testing right now. So when I go on and I do NPX player tests, this should fail initially, not because I made a mistake, but because this is visual regression snapshot testing. And right now, because I just kicked it off for the first time, there's nothing to compare it with. So when I now run this command again, we should have some passing tests over here because we did successful visual regression. Here we have the two screenshots that we just took. So here we have the dark mode, here we have the light mode. And just to prove the point that this is actually working, let me just open that up. Let's make a little bit of art without AI here, but I'm just going old school. Let me just do this. So I'm just editing the snapshot here right now, which means now when I run my tests again, I should have a failed visual regression because, well, yeah, I fiddled with the image, right? It's telling me, hey, these pixels are right now different. Please have a look. This can be very interesting when you do component testing, when you do layout testing, if these kind of things are important to you. I think this is just a very handy, nice little gimmick. But what if you, for example, do an e-commerce store and you have some dynamic data in there, right? Something that's the carousel, that marketing controls, or something else. What you always can do is you can also go in and you can start masking out things, which I found to be very handy for, uh, especially when you do screenshots. So what I do is I add a mask property. I will do, go here, I will do update snapshots so that my little drawing will disappear. And when we now have a look here, we just blurt out something so that it's not messing with my re visual regression testing. This can be very handy, again, for these kind of um, carousels, whatever you have, what has a fixed size. It's not only about pages, though. If you want to do components, so DOM elements, and want to sc screenshot these, you can do that too. So let's just grab the H1 and say to have screenshot headline PNG. And now what we have here is that I'm also taking screenshots on a component level. So here we have the fancy headline. So I think this is just a very nice way. But I wouldn't say that you need these for headless debugging, because I will show you some more tools to do headless debugging. But if your visual regression is your kind of jam, I think this is, a, this is a good way to do these kind of things. But what I want to show you next is how you actually can handle all this auto weighting and all these assertions to not rely on weight for statements. So when I go to my little website here, this is localhost, right? That's playwright.dev running on my localhost. Um, I brought in a little Easter egg. Ta -da! because more sites need more confetti, in my opinion. Um, but even though it's a little bit overused, because it's this one library everybody uses, but I need something better. If you know something better, let me know. So what we do is we um, locate the headline, and we locate the way that the confetti works is that the JavaScript library injects canvas element, draws all the confetti, and at some point it will remove the canvas element again. So how would you now test that? You could now start adding, oh, I'm waiting for canvas element, I'm waiting for this, and oh, how do I do this? In Playwright, this is all pretty streamlined. So what we want to do is we want to wait, expect, then we have the canvas locator that locates um, the canvas element. So we do, all right, we expect that there is no initial canvas element, first of all. Then we say, okay, we want to click the headline. So let's click the headline, and now, I'm just duplicating the logic here. And even though this looks very streamlined, right, this is asynchronous operations. It's checking, it's waiting for the state of no canvas being available. It's clicking the button, it's waiting for the state of one canvas being available, and then it's just waiting for the state that this canvas disappears eventually. This means that I can write really streamlined end-to-end -to -end tests without being bothered about all this uh, logic to figure out when an element shows up or when it disappears. So I hope this works. You see that the test is now taking a little bit longer because the animations take, it, uh, take a second here. So let me just prove to you that this works. So let's do this again. So I should now have a faulty test here because, well, there won't be two canvas elements. And what happens now is that this second condition to have count two is timing out. It's blowing up your test. And um, so this way you can write very streamlined tests. So two more. Um, if you're doing a lot of end-to-end -end tests, for example, against staging or production environments, there might be a situation where you want to start blocking resources, right? If you run your end-to-end -end tests against a staging or production environment, you maybe don't want to reload uh, all the images. Maybe you want to break uh, or not make your marketers unhappy because you're running so many headless tests and you're showing up in all the tracking and everybody wonders why there's so much traffic on the website. And um, you can always 
hook into the network layer with event handlers. So what you see here is that I have a page on response handler, and what I always can do is I can go in. Um, the test is called high quality, so I want to check that I don't have any 300 or 400s or something in the page. Then let's just grab the resources that are in with these status codes. Let's push them to the array. Let's create the array because we don't have it yet. Here we go. And now because my tests are currently structured that I'm already navigating to localhost 8080 over here, I have to do a reload because otherwise that won't work. Um, usually you would restructure your test a little bit if you want to do this. And now I can do expect um, not found to have length zero. So let's see how this goes. So I'm kicking off another player test. And as you see, well, if you do websites have save as, right, you usually don't get all the stuff. So my playwright docs don't have high quality here right now, but I'm not showing you how I download on debug source maps of all the JavaScript that is um, included in the page. So let me just mark this test as fix me and fix it later at home, maybe not, and, and run the test again so that we are all green again. And then in very rare occasions, when you maybe want to do some custom logic that is not included in the Playwright framework itself or with the functionality that you want to do, um, what you always can do is just for, for completeness reason, because I'm kind of a perf person and uh, maybe I want to evaluate what the largest contentful page is in a certain website. If you need something custom, you can always use Page Evaluate to push on some custom JavaScript into the session that you're currently running. So what I'm doing here is I'm injecting a performance observer just to get out the metric, like just Contentful Paint, because maybe I want to put it somewhere, maybe I want to monitor that. Um, yeah. So and then you can handle back, so it's important. This context here is inside of the headless browser session or the browser session, and then you can pass it back to the node playwright context over here. So let's just do a quick assertion here. Um, and I'm doing very poor number casting here because currently it's a string. Um, to be less than, we're talking milliseconds here and I'm working locally, so let's have a look what comes out here. Bam. Yeah, the confetti test is slowing things down, that is correct. I think let's just check if this works when we're going um, with a very low number. Cool, so largest contentful paint, testing my own local website here is 150 milliseconds, no surprise that it's super fast. Um, but let's go with 500 here. So I think these are all nice, very nice mechanics to test um, your stuff itself, but what was previously always a challenge is when you run your test in CICD, right? How do you debug this stuff? And how do you debug, it's like the typical, it works on my machine problem, right? This is, this is the moment where usually, especially in a headless world, where you're like, ah, I don't know what's happening. Um, so if you run these cases and you run Playwright in CICD or for monitoring, what you can always do is you can use something that is called a trace file. And I like to um, think, about of, uh, think about it as time travel debugging, actually. With the default configuration, trace files, as you saw, will only be created on first try. Um, we are currently here not in a process and CI setup, so we don't have this set, which means I'm just turning on trace files. And now check this out, because I think this is very cool. Whenever you now run a trace, I just configured that we want to run traces, and a trace file is pretty much a user file, right? So what should you, what should you do with this? Player comes with a tooling for that, so you can always do npx playwright show trace. So let me just pick up a random, the trace file for the random click around. So remember, this was generated when I ran this particular test case. Usually you want to have that in CICD and was like, hey, your test failed, here's some information. So when I now call show trace, here we have our test run. It includes the timeline of the things that were happening. So here we see, okay, we navigated there. Here we have the Algolia window showing up for just a second. Here we have all the actions that have been taken. This is recorded. We have the similar state here, right? This is again a website, an HTML snapshot. So this gives you the tools to really debug what happened. Why did things fail? So this is just the time travel, time travel debugging. All right, this went wrong. And this is what we have to fix because we reached this state. 
I think this was all about the live demo here, so let me just wrap it up very quickly and see how I am on time. Pretty good. So, play rate in a nutshell. I showed you a lot here right now, so I think it is a very decent tool. It's wonderful to work for us. So it comes with, comes with auto rating so that you don't have to do wait for us uh, statements. It comes with web first assertion, screenshots, test runner, retries. I didn't cover like, these too much. Tracing, the VS Code extension, the inspector, the debugger, code and image snapshots, and for everybody waiting for watch mode, there is now the new native UI, which makes writing playwright tests much, much nicer. If you're curious or if you want to learn more about the Playwright universe, because I'm doing it at work, I'm publishing almost weekly um, player tips on YouTube. Um, I'm still discovering the uh, nitty gritty details about Playwright and what is happening. So you can expect a weekly, maybe every second week, depending on the workload. Um, but overall, I think when you want to test end to end, usually there is no silver bullet because sometimes you have applications that are just tremendously slow. Sometimes you have applications that have different edge cases. It really depends on what you're dealing with to write your end to end tests. But after doing Playwright now for over a year, I can tell you, I honestly think that is a very, very, very good solution. And it's way easier for me than all the things that I used before. But I do think that we as developers are the front end crew. We should also start treating our UIs like we do our APIs, right? So running your end-to-end -end tests, for example, in, uh, on deployment is, I do think, only part of the story. Because when we, for example, if I'm building an application and I'm using a third-party API, what, what is the first thing that I probably ask about? What's your SLA? What's your availability? How many nines are we talking about, right? For APIs, this is very, very common standard. But, I'm also a heavy internet and website user. How often do I click around in a SaaS product in a web app and it's like, oh, this is broken, isn't it? And then it works the other day. I think, here's my hot take for today, I do think that entire web applications should be tested end to end all the time, just to guarantee that everything is working. And would love, honestly, would love to see status pages that are not only describing APIs, 9999999, but we are confident that 999 times of a thousand, my front end is doing it what it is supposed to do. And it's also getting a little bit more tricky, right? So I'm in the SaaS business for quite a while. Usually you use a third party vendor for login, of zero, right? Or you use this tool for this tool. You use another tool for another thing. Other downtimes very, very quickly can mean that you are down too. So and this is why it's important to monitor your applications end to end all the time. If you um, want to learn more about how you could impact or figure out what third-party scripts in your website have an effect on your own production sites, um, I wrote a blog post about that. But overall, yeah, I think that end-to-end -end monitoring should be your safety net because I'm one of these people that deploys stuff and then doesn't sleep well because I wonder, hey, this serverless function is running for two years. Is it actually working? I, I, I'm, I'm kind of this person, and end-to-end -end monitoring helps with that, uh, and it helps with stop, uh, to start shipping with confidence. And here we go, 30 minutes. Thank you, everybody. I'm Stefan. Thanks, a ton, Stefan. Um, we are severe when it comes to the time of the next session, so I would ask all of you whether it is okay, or actually whether it isn't okay for all of you if we go right to the next session, after I asked you whether you have questions to Stefan, uh, without any further break, is that fine? Brilliant. Is this a question? Uh, so you said you are uh, using Playwright for testing. Um, do you use other applications as well, or is Playwright uh, enough to uh, cover all the tests you need? So th that is a disclaimer. I work uh, for a SaaS company and we provide a Playwright in the cloud. So as my day job, I deal with customers doing Playwright in our cloud. Okay, thank you. Okay, that was quick. Two, two more, three more. Okay. Ah. Oh. Yeah. I remember there was an issue with, um, I used Azure Pipelines and I had to uh, install binaries for Playwright, and I had to pin the version to match the version of the package that I used. And I had to do this monstrous shell script to discover what's the current version and download the appropriate packages. Is there any kind of change that way it auto-detects now? 
That is an an a question that I don't have the answer to, but this is the situation we talked about, Max. <laughs> Max might help you out to later. He's, he's working and on playwright. Okay. If it's fine by you, I would place that after the last session. Yeah, just one minute sentence for such a question. It's just by an addition we have. Uh, we will usually triage like under 24 hours. Well, it's not an issue. I guess it's a yeah, major. Yeah, yeah, anything manual should not be a Cool. Thanks. Alrighty. Um, as I said, there is time after the next session, and that's why. Um, I would kindly ask all of you to welcome what might very well be a historic guest on a stage of Microsoft Reactor. Google Fund, very own Tobias Kunisch, their design lead. Please welcome him. Hi, everyone. Look at that picture of me. Um, let me try to see if I can make this work. Do I need to switch inputs on this one somehow? Oh. No? Here we are. All right. All right. So I promise you this one will be AI and fairly code free. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about fonts um, and specifically about how fonts are software, especially these days. Uh, my name is Tobias. I have been with uh, a company called Google for the last 13 years. I lead the design team uh, of the Google Fonts team. Um, I actually co-founded the team about 12 years ago as um, like one of those 20% projects that they let you do at Google. So let's dive in. I'm going to try to be real quick so everyone can get back to the beer outside. Um, I want to introduce you to this gentleman. His name is Aldous Manutius. He lived in the 15th and 16th century, and he's known for many things, apart, like one of them uh, being he ran a printing company. Uh, at this printing company, he invented a format of books that uh, eventually became uh, pocket books, uh, which got a lot more people into reading. Another thing that he did is he commissioned uh, his type designer, uh, called uh, Griffo to cut the first cursive font. There were no cursive fonts before. This was sort of his idea to replicate handwriting uh, in printing. And back then when you had the idea to create a new style for a font, you had to cast it in metal, right? Like fonts were sets of little metal pieces containing several um, uh, pieces of the same letter so you could print them into a page, put them, set them in a page and uh, use them in printing. Um, so to create a cursive font you had to create an extra set of metal that was this cursive version of the other set of metal that you already had in regular. Um, and another thing that happened in printing back then, you had to have an extra, another extra set of metal for each size that you printed in, right? So this is an example of different lowercase a's ranging from very small four point to very large 72 point. Um, they're all scaled to the same size to demonstrate how the shape of, the, of this lowercase a was actually a little different between small, medium and large. This is called optical size and was there to optimize your reading, your perception of the A and small and large to be basically the same. And for it to be the same, it had to be different to, perceive, to be perceived by the human eye as the same. So this still persists in software, right? Like we have a different font file for every regular, italic, thin, thin italic, like any combination. And you have the same again for condensed. Um, at the bottom here, I'm showing Roboto in Fontbook in, on our uh, Mac OS device. This also still persists in text editors, like here, uh, Microsoft Word, showing Calibri and the different cuts, right? This is the same thing, light, light, italic, regular. It's the same thing as back in the day when, you know, there were different uh, sets of metal. So the software that we use today um, that uh, uh, we 
we used to create funds is based on the open type standard. That's from 1996. There was a collaboration between Adobe and Microsoft. Back then, there were actually different standards that were competing. Apple had one. There were others. Uh, eventually, everyone aligned on the open type standard. And in 2016, um, Google, Apple, Adobe, and Microsoft collaborates on an extension to the OpenType format, where it's called the OpenType font variations, uh, more commonly known as variable fonts. Um, and variable fonts make it possible to have all these stylistic variations, all your condensed and italics and you know, uh, all the other styles in one font file. Uh, and this finally makes it possible to use fonts programmatically as you would with real software and manipulate them at runtime. Um, so what's good about that? Uh, we usually talk about like three different sets of benefits that you get from that. Uh, we talk about compression, text finesse, and expression. So let's look into those. So the compression part is all about like smaller file sizes. Now you have one file size, one variable font that you need to use in your website or in your project or in your app. That's a little bigger than a regular font file. But you know, with regular fonts, you need several of those files. And if you use you know, two or more um, uh, styles from a font you know, and the corresponding font files, um, you get a bigger file size than you would get from a variable font. So there's, you know, that's the compression, compression aspect. Um, the finesse comes in with like the things you can do with it and how you can optimize your typography. So this is showing what's called the weight axes. So these different features like weight and like all the other styles that you can package into a variable font file are called variable axes. Because now you can create a range, in this case, uh, weight from 100 to 1,000. Um, these are very random numbers, they're from OS2 times, but um, a weight one is very, very thin, a weight thousand is very, very thick, and now you can uh, uh, extrapolate between all those weights. So you can basically just pick any, you can pick weight 369 uh, and you can access that. And you can access and you can change the weight during runtime to create these animations. This is the width axis that usually ranges from 25 to something like 150, like it's up to every fun uh, designer to define their own ranges and what they want them to do. Uh, but this is, a, this is a very nice way to create condensed type or very wide type or anything in between. Um, so I'm going to switch to this tool over here. We built a little demo, the material uh, DevRel team built that for us. Um, we recently introduced a new version of Roboto, it's Roboto Serif, which is basically you know, a very similar typeface um, as, you know, uh, as Roboto is, which you might know from Android devices, just with serifs. And this uh, is here to demonstrate you the width and the weight axis. And you can see down here, I hope this isn't too small, um, there are new CSS rules that were introduced with variable fonts that you can use to manipulate these axes. So basically, Font variation settings is what you use, and you just address the name of the, of the variable axis that you want to manipulate. And can, then you can basically set any value on this axis to create these different styles. OK, going back to the slideshow. So what I showed you earlier with the different you know, letter shapes designed based on the, on the size, this is now also possible, just like within one font file. Uh, and a variable font that uses optical size, as it's called, um, can automatically adjust the, the shape of the letter based on the size it's used in. So on the left, uh, you see this lowercase a with optical size, and at larger sizes, the strokes are thinner, because at larger sizes, you don't need you know, chunky strokes like you see on the right. On the right, it's the same thing without the optical size, which just scales up, um, so it looks very chunky and very heavy. The nice thing about optical size is that it's supported by all modern browsers. There's one called IE that doesn't support it, but I don't think anyone's using that. Um, and uh, all modern browsers don't only understand optical sizing, but also um, apply it automatically. So if you have a font that has optical, optical size built in, it basically will automatically pick the right letter shape for the size you use the font in. Uh, I'm not going to show you this video, but I'm going to show you the website it's based on. 
uh, which is a little website, a little demo website that we built for Roboto Serif. Um, to show you this in another, in another way, so this is width, right? So you can now go very condensed with your text, very wide. We've built optical size in here, like the text scales with it, as it as, you know, makes sense. You know, this is weight. And what's interesting about weight, uh, usually, and you will have seen this, if you uh, make a font very bold using a high weight value, the text reflows, right? Because like all the metrics adjust accordingly. Um, a lot of variable fonts also have a feature called grade, which does the same thing as weight, it just doesn't change the metrics. So for example, if you hover over a button and you want that to become bold to signify that you're like hovering over it, uh, you can now do that without you know, changing the label length and you know, adjusting the padding and all that. So um, I find that very useful. Going back to the presentation, um, so I just showed you Roboto Flex. We also have a new variable version of Roboto. It's called Roboto, uh, I showed you Google, uh, Roboto Serif. Now I'm showing you Roboto Flex, which is the new super variable version of Roboto that has additional axes that we call parametric axes um, that you can use to fine tune uh, like really heavily the type that you're using. I'm just skipping into this video to show you a little bit of like what can be done with those parametric axes without showing you the whole video because we're running short of time a little bit. Um, but you sort of get the idea. Um, and if I change over to this site, this is fonts.google.com, um, you can try all this out. Uh, so if you look at this lowercase, if you look at the lowercase g or the lowercase y, y uh, you can change the length of the descenders. Um, grade is here, what I showed you, like the, the weight without the metrics change. You can change the width of the counters. You can change the height of the ascenders if you look at the f, for example, and so on. So you can use this to really fine tune your, uh, your typography. One very nice application of that is like, I think at this point we all know that you shouldn't justify text on the web because it looks awful, it creates all those holes. Like with a font with parametric axes, you can, you can, you know, you can still do that because you can have the font adjust um, to fill that space and just um, create good typography regardless. Um, the same is possible for icons. Um, the Google Fonts team also maintains the material design icon set. We updated that to all be variable fonts now. We call them material symbols. Um, and those have weight and grade and optical size just the same, uh, which can be very useful. Like if you go to fonts.google.com slash icons, you can try them all out. There are sliders for everything and you can download the exact uh, icon that you need for your design. So that was the finesse part. Uh, and I want to touch on the express part also, because while finesse is you know, all about optimizing your typography and your project, the finesse part is you know, really about like big expression things that you can do with these fonts. Any type designer can come up with any uh, variable axes that can build in there into their, into their project. Um, so one font family that we, we released recently is the tilt fonts. Uh, and tilt is inspired by shop signs, you know, that, you know, those neon shop signs that say open or closed or, you know, um, are, you know, around, I don't know, a lamppost or whatever. Um, this one has like all these axes built in to replicate this and, you know, to make them feel three dimensional. Um, I'm just gonna stay in this mode. Another typeface that I wanted to show you is called Kablamo by Vectrotype. Um, this is the website we built for it. Uh, and this font has an axis called the morph axis. That sort of makes all these like little features, the holes in the K, little strokes running around. Like with the, with the morph axis, you can manipulate those. And what we're doing here is basically just running a uh, JavaScript that's, you know, that's changing the value uh, assigned to the morph axis. Um, so there's very neat things that you can do with this, right? Um, 
Another fund that I'm really uh, quite excited about is called Chantelle Sons. Uh, this was a collaboration we had with an artist called Chantelle Martin. She's based in New York, uh, originally from Britain. Um, and her um, art is, uh, incorporates a lot of her own handwriting. Uh, so we worked with her and a foundry called Aerotype to create a handwriting font that's a variable font. Uh, you're seeing animated here. There's also a Cyrillic version that we worked on. Um, and the axes, <clears throat> the axes applied here are called bounce and imperfection. The bounce axis is so that like the letters don't all sit on the same baseline because if you write, I'm sure you don't place like the letters all in the same line uh, each time you write a letter. Um, so with the bounce axis, you just like create that sort of like you know bounce effect in the font, and the imperfection makes it so not every letter is like the exact same as you also wouldn't do it when you uh, write with your own hand. Um, another fund that's gone through the uh, through the media a little bit recently is the climate crisis fund. That fund has a year axis, uh, and you can use that to simulate. Uh, the melting uh, polar caps in the design of the letter shapes. So the axis ranges, ranges from 1979 to 2050, so sort of like demonstrating the projected impact of uh, the climate crisis. And then there's another new standard called color fonts. Um, what you're seeing here is a variable color font, it's called Nabla. Um, something that we worked on with a, a few touch di uh, Dutch type designers recently. Um, color fonts are very interesting. We originally uh, invested in the standard because we wanted to find a good solution for the Nodo emoji set that's used on Android devices. Um, and all um, emoji that you see on Android devices now are actually color fonts. And we use that same technology to create like uh, this uh, uh, demo font. Um, that has all these gradients and this uh, sort of isomorphic effect. And what's interesting about these color fonts, because you might say, you know, I can change the font color any font, uh, but they have gradients and they have these color palettes built in, so you can basically, with your CSS, just like choose which color palette you want to show. You want it to show. You can, you know, change your color palette when you, you know, user changes to night mode, for example. Um, and you can also use CSS to manipulate the colors just by hand. You can assign different values. Um, so just to show you this one, oh, we're at 745, we're doing good. Um, so I can make this bigger. Um, so, you know, if you see here, these are the axes that I manipulate. Um, and you can do all that um, in your web project or in your app on just manipulating these values. Um, all right, that was quick. That's all I had. Here are a few links for you. Uh, all of this on fonts.google.com. The demo site that I showed you is on the second link. We have a lot of articles about these uh, typefaces on material.io slash blog. Um, and in addition, there's a really nice code lab on developers.google.com. It's called Migrating to Variable Fonts. Uh, which gives you sort of like a step-by-step -step guide how you can switch over and make use of variable fonts. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tobias. Um, I'm going to be very liberal with my own uh, prerogative to ask a question. You know, uh, you said basically this is all about creating good typography, which in my head means readability. Um, there can be more aspects to it, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but uh, we often see that users are uh, exaggerating even the very basic possibilities of manipulating text and fonts that they currently have. How do we um, enable them? How do we teach them to handle this responsibly uh, to remain readable and to be actually useful? Right. So that's a very, readability is a very deep topic, right, and one that we think about a lot. Um, there are several dimensions to it, right? Like one is like there are typefaces that are known to be more readable and some are less readable, right? Uh, actually, you know, a lot of people make a lot of shows, jokes about Comic Sans, but Comic Sans is actually a very readable typeface, uh, especially for... Google one as well. No. Uh, Lobster is another very readable typeface. Um, <laughs> 
so uh, so that's one thing, right? And there's like things to know about like finding finding a good typeface that that uh, emphasizes readability. Another one is you know you just have to be a little knowledgeable about how you set your type, right? Like what I showed you, like especially Roboto Flex with all those crazy options. Like you can make very good typography with it, but you can also make very bad typography with it, right? Like if I give you a saxophone, you can either make very good music with it or you can make terrible music. You will make terrible music. Me too, but some people are awesome with it. So, you know, it all depends a little bit. Like you can't all do it like with, you know, one typeface. There are typefaces um, that make uh, use, I'm not wearing my reading glasses, that make use of um, variable fonts to increase uh, readability for dyslexic readers, for example. Um, one is called Lexend. Um, and it has an axis called hyperextension. So what you see on the right here, you see the width of this word uh, vary uh, between those different lines. Um, and this is actually to counter uh, an effect for that, that um, dyslexic readers experience called crowding, where like letters run into each other. So Lexan is designed so that people can use this axis to find the right width of you know, the, the letters and the words uh, to avoid you know, their sense of crowding that's different for everyone. So we think that variable fonts can help with people finding the right setting for them to create the readability that they need. Because there's a lot of recent research that shows that um, if you test with a group of participants, the same font can be perceived as the most readable and the least readable by groups of people. Right? Like we have, we're working with the University of Florida um, on the readability consortium that also includes Adobe and they have like really interesting um, studies that show that like Roboto for example like in a test group seven people said it's the most readable of like a bunch of fonts that they uh, were shown and another group said it's the least readable so I think it's all about like what you personally need and enabling your users to pick the one that helps them Thanks. Um, after that very fulfilling response. Any questions from the audience? Yes, amazing. Sorry, these guys were first, but I'll get to you, I promise. Um, for the colorful 3D font that you had at the end, right? Um, you played with the depth, and it looked like the depth was exactly visually stopping at the next character. Um, can they overlap? How does that work with variable fonts? I was just like, huh. Is that possible? Um, In the fake 3D space, I assume? Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. So, yeah, they yeah, stop exactly. right there. So, I mean, there are good fonts and there are bad fonts, right? Like, you, what, you, what you will find on, you know, some websites on the internet that, you know, provide a lot of, like, free font that have, like, you know, no information about license. Those are fonts that are quickly made that aren't really like, you know, uh, made with quality in mind. So uh, with fonts created by thoughtful type designers, like a lot of that can be, you know, sort of like prevented from the start. Um, we think this is a really good font. However, you know, like you can manipulate the, the letter spacing here, right? You can use CSS to pull this R and this E together, and then they will run into each other, right? So there's like, you know, great power, great responsibility, right? You can really mess it up, but you can really do really great things also. Thanks. Is it just a display or is there also some dithering going on? It might be just a screen, right? I think that might just be the screen. Shame. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's another question. Uh, and yeah, we had him first. Beg your pardon, I'll be with you in a couple of seconds. So these uh, dynamical uh, Google Fonts, is every Fong, Fong uh, um, uh, an individual project uh, done by Google or do you guys have some kind of platform or some kind of uh, um, software tool uh, that you use to create those uh, dynamic Fonts? Um, so this is a shared standard by, you know, by the industry, right? Like the variable font standard has been created by uh, the, you know, a working group that comprises Apple, Adobe, Microsoft, and Google. 
It's an open standard. It's documented on the Microsoft typography website. Uh, so anyone can create a variable font. Uh, the ones that I showed you weren't all created by us, like Roboto Serif and Roboto Flex, were, you know, that's work that we commissioned. The Climate Crisis Fund, for example, is just an open source fund that we, we had contributed to, the, to our library. We had one more. That was you. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, how do these uh, fonts get distributed? Like only TTF or also like WAF2? Or uh, how does this apply to that? Um, so it depends how you choose to use them, right? Like you can, um, so like these are all open source, right? So you can go to GitHub and download them. You can also choose to go to fonts.google.com and download them. Or you can choose to use our API. Um, so picking Roboto, for example. Um, which just provides like an embed link and then you can, you know, that will generate the right code for you, like the add font face rules and give you the CSS. Um, and when you use our API, we do our best to optimize for the browser that your client is using. So most of the time that will be WAF2. Um, there are some browsers that don't understand WAF2 and then we optimize it differently for them. If there are no other questions, I would have one. Um, not to you, thanks a ton, Tobias. Um, this is A, to the speakers that we had tonight, which are luckily still with us, uh, not, not alive, but in this place. Um, and to you as the guests, uh, as you might have read on the media and the internet, uh, stuff is very uncertain uh, at Microsoft, so we don't know how all of the initiatives that we are doing are ought to continue. Um, which is why I would appreciate, for those of you for whom it is okay, if we could take a photo in front of the stage with those of you who want, because you never know when we will meet again in a place like this, in uh, circumstances like these. So I would greatly appreciate if those of you who would want to be on the photo could step up before you go outside to continue to have conversations. And as well, the I wanted to say beautiful, what is it with me today? The awesome and amazing speakers that we've had tonight um, together on stage so we can have a picture. That would be brilliant. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. It was such a pleasure.